president of the advance spine on Park Avenue uh, Institute of New York, USA, and he is the uh, he was immediate past uh, president of ISA, the International uh, American Society of Study of uh, Pain Practice, and he is very renowned to our uh, pain uh, interventional pain uh, figure because. He uh, he already uh, written a lot of uh, in interventional pain books, and they are the famous in worldwide. And now I introduce our today's speaker. He is very uh, renowned in the um, not only India but also the uh, uh, worldwide. And uh, he is very much uh, uh, not only famous for his work. He is very much jolly mind and uh, attend in our every program and. Uh, in this our program after uh, complete our lecture and uh, just we are amazing uh, because we uh, we already get him uh, in, in, at least every program and uh, he is uh, dr nia jain sir he is mbbs md fimsa and uh, FI, uh, fipp usa and cips hungary because uh, this fipp and cips is the most um, prestigious degree in the interventional pain uh, faculty and he is also a uh, senior consultant and uh, spine and pain specialist in the uh, sir balaji action medical college institute and action cancer hospital and he have a lot of uh, a lot of uh, international publications and uh, uh, he already conduct a lot of training program and uh, really that was uh, enjoyable and now I request to Dr. Uh, Jayan sir, please um, uh, please give your uh, today's lecture because it is very enjoyable and everyone uh, uh, waiting for this lecture. Okay, thank you sir. My pleasure, my dear friend. Thanks for introduction and thanks Dr. Diwan for chairing the session. I'm really grateful, you know, and honored you being around uh, to chair the session. It's a very, very useful practical talk. I'll share my screen and uh, then we go ahead and you can mute all other friends. In the meantime, I'll just share my screen because I chose this talk because it's so, so practical in the given scenarios and these days, you know, with the osteoporosis setting in. So we'll just talk it out. And I do feel and nowhere in the pain medicine, there is such an amount of uh, kind of uh, relief to the patient, dramatic relief to the patient that I was just uh, talking to the answer from uh, bench to wrench. And you go, your patient comes in a stretcher and goes back home walking. So such is the beauty of the procedure. So I think let's talk it in detail, but it's very important to know it day in day out because uh, doing it wrong will be a disaster. So it's uh, as uh, dramatic as the positive result, as dramatic as the negative result of the procedure. So it's good that we uh, take nuances, all the uh, intricacies of the procedure and detailing the procedure so that we do it right for a benefit of the patient. So this is, and I'm going to talk about the vertebral plan. I'm going to talk about the burst fracture. I'm going to talk about how do I do a balloon, interior abdominal space balloon along with the uh, Kyphon balloon and how I've done about six level vertiplasty in one go which was a world record initially in 2010 and then others have done more. So we're going to talk it down the line. These are the high end of the procedures. You know, this is uh, the fact of the matter now. Let's talk very frankly. What is happening is we are at the, this time is about 2020 and more and more time passes, more and more people are with, with age 85 and over or 65 and over are going to be there in the main population range. Look at this million people, so many million people. Not only in USA, even the developing countries are also having a age expectancy increasing and more the age expectancy, more is the morbid and morbidity and disease and age related phenomena and problems coming in. And osteoporosis being one of the very, very common problem. So we have to address it now. This is typical of this uh, age related issues. And uh, the fact is that as age increases, the chances of having a vertebral fracture increases to the extent of 75% or 70-75% in the age of 95 and age and plus. But suppose let's take it 85, which is in Japan and USA already. We have 50% of the patients who have a radiological fracture. They may be asymptomatic sometime, but then over a period of time, they have collateral damage coming in and they start getting more symptomatic. So this is the amount of magnitude of the problem. This is how it is, like low back pain. And uh, this is 15.6% of the all ladies in their lifetime will have a fracture of the spine. And this is known thing, this was in 2002. And we can expect this is already increased. It was 7 million, 700,000. I have checked uh, data today, this is 1.4 million already. People are having each year fracture in the USA alone. And let's not talk about the world. World is such a big uh, deal then. 
So the indication for duodiplasty is that's why we discussing all this now and it's so imperative over period time you realize how important it is to do duodiplasty in given set of patients. If this is the 83 percent will be having a problem with the senile lost body fract compression fractures and there about uh, malignancy patients will have three percent will have a metastatic fractures and they may be a primary maybe secondary mostly it is a secondary and being 33 vertebras there are so many skeletal mats which uh, give a problem to the patient. Multiple myeloma is one of them. Here the beauty is it is a correctable curable disease. When you do a vertiplasty in a metastatic one it's a more a palliative one but here it is a curative. So you have to uh, you know kind of adjust accordingly. We'll talk we'll discuss that in uh, due course of time. And aggressive vertebral hemangioma that's where actually vertiplasty was started in 1984 by Dermond and other people and that's uh, that's uh, in the cervical c2 hemangioma aggressive hemangioma and they were thinking what to do with hemangioma you can't operate there's no screw c2 so they put in a drop of cement and it embolization just for embolization and it worked very well so that's how it started it was a, a discovery by you can say by accident or by you know trial and then it become very very popular amongst europe after 1984 in 1993 only it started in the usa by jensen and now usa is doing more vertiplasty than the uh, europe uh, together and now there's a vertebral cumulus or uh, uh, avascular osteonecrosis is another problem and that's where there's a gap in the bone we'll discuss it and the whole strengthening of the uh, vertebral body uh, before any major spine surgery especially in osteoporotic setting in age population senile osteoporotic patients any surgery they want to do for fixation or something they strengthen the vertebra first and then they put in because they have to have a screw purchase otherwise screws they come out and that's another reason and it has been extended into the uh, traumatic fractures in the polytrauma setting. This is what I was saying, aggressive vertebral hemangiomas. It has to be painful, it has to be aggressive, it has to be dangerous. Then only you see them in them. Otherwise, there are incidental hemangiomas, you don't touch them, you leave them alone before they become uh, really bothersome. One more important point here is, sometimes these hemangiomas, they have a fallout in the epidural space. So you have to be careful when you're doing the cementing for these vertebral hemangiomas that you are not putting your cement into the epidural space so that can cause a neural compression. You have to be careful on that. And this is, I told you, metastasis spine is very, very common place where you have all these mats coming. And these mats are sometimes dangerous because if it collapses, it can cause a cord compression and issue. Although it may be contiguous tumor spread into the spinal canal, which can cause problem. So that's a different story. But if there is a collapse along with that, you will have to manage that collapse, collapse part. And there are new treatments come in. We'll discuss it in due course. And this is, uh, I told you about the strengthening of the vertebral body. You're trying to do something here. If you are not put a cement in these places, these screws won't hold. The bone which can't hold by itself, how will it hold those screws and another extra weight on these things? And that is important. This is a beautiful thing that people who are doing all this spine uh, disc procedures, they are when they are doing hybridization, hybrid procedures, and they are trying to put screws and implants into the vertebral body, if they find it osteoporotic, like in older age group for sure, what they're doing is they're putting needles right through the end plates into the bone, vertebral body and putting cement first and then putting all these screws. So instead of putting another um, uh, vertiplasty thing in there, either you have a cannulated screws which have got a cement uh, injection devices and it injects cement through the screw. That is one aspect, cemented screw, but they're costly. Or other thing which they want is cheaper is they put a needle through the end plate, cement inside the vertebral body and then put the screws and fix it. This is another very intelligent, very, very intelligent. This is, as I said, the communal osteo necrosis, you, you feel very happy. You find a void in the bone and there is air, air uh, phenomena in the lateral x-ray, especially in the extension. Oh, good. I want to put in cement. But there's a hindsight to that. And the hindsight is they found the studies that these uh, vertebral um, uh, blocks which you put inside, the cement blocks, if they don't hold well with the bones, trabeculations, or they don't integrate into the trabecular systems, they tend to be free. And then they, they can lose out and they can go out. So one has to be very, very careful when you get these kind of things. When you're putting cement end block, you have to make it sure that it has to interdigitate with the vertebral body itself to hold itself there. Otherwise, it might migrate. Uh, this is, a, uh, which I said, a senile osteoporotic ladies and they sometimes they're steroid dependent, medicine dependent and they have osteoporosis coming in for other reasons or deficiency disease. And this is a common issue and they have an empty bone phenomena. And this, this, this is something and sometimes they have a fracture with, with a very trivial trauma. They don't even remember what caused them the fracture. But you have a radiology evident fracture and it's painful also, but they don't remember sometimes or a little trauma can cause the problem. This is the Dennis theory. This is the anterior column and this is the middle column and the posterior column. 
and it is important to know if you have two columns gone this is uh, this is single column you, you have a stable fracture you can simply cement and if there are two columns you can still go and cement but this little unsafe if all three segments are gone it's surely unsafe and it needs a fixation device but for interior column reconstruction if you can manage interior column reconstruction and posterior is intact your middle column will heal over a period of time the theory is you start working cement from anterior to posterior and stop somewhere in the posterior one third and that is where the uh, strengthening of the bone is there and typically biogeometry is when the, 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 you just see how much is the wedging and this is the interior loss and when you find the interior loss is uh, this much or you have a corpse angle coming in and it's more than 15 degree along with the osteoporosis or more than 25 degree by itself these are the patients you have to cement otherwise you have to do instrument you have to do surgery otherwise you can leave them alone and very good medications are there these days all these anti-resorptive medicines and bone forming medicines and they can tend to heal most of the time and it, times are changing you know but there are number of patients who just land to us with like this and it's a very very bad thing to happen with anybody you know that if it's totally collapsed if patient is complaining with back pain not realizing how serious can be this can be there if this uh, this kind of uh, falls into the spinal canal or another thing one has to remember this called a uh, cascade phenomena because this is collapsed there is an increased uh, mechanical pressure on the adjacent vertebras and obviously if they are osteoporotic for some reason like in this patient these she, this patient had a five free previous fracture healed the six fracture came up for eight months didn't heal patient expecting it to heal but yes patient is aging osteoporosis is setting in and some fracture can be more pathological than the other ones it didn't heal and most importantly this was at the dorsal lumbar angle the dorsal lumbar angle there's a maximum loading at the d12 l1 area because the dorsal area is fixed with the uh, ribs and the lumbar area is easy because there is a lordosis it is only the dl junction where there is a uh, the kyphotic angle comes in and this more unstable and more loading is there and the more chances of fracture happening at this level and this is what happens this is what is influencing the cascade this is the bone properties there's so much to do with the bone properties and there is something like neurophysiological property of the older age thing the muscle and other thing and patients bedridden all those things come in or comorbidities for their matter here diabetes and other problems and then you have a spine properties like a local spine issues or global spine issues they all put together cause a problem and it is said if patient has got a vertebral uh, osteoporosis and he's got a uh, one fracture chances of having another fracture is five folds if patient has got two fractures or more fractures chances of having another fracture is 12 folds than general population look at this if patient has got two or more fracture with 33 percent of the bone mass loss patients having 75 fold chances of another fracture this every likelihood the patient have another fracture the whole more of the story is if you find a patient in fracture in osteoporotic setting you have to treat osteoporosis that's a primary disease the fracture is a fallout of that problem, primary problem. So you have to manage that part. So this is important to understand. It is seen sometimes fractures do heal radiologically, but patients keep on having chronic back pain because of the change mechanics. The myofascial syndrome comes in or the facet joints start bothering or there's a micro fracture going on in this osteoporotic bones. So they keep having this pain. It is said 45% of the people who have healed radiologically can still have a back pain. And they remember their fracture for that matter. What I'm trying to say, they remember their back and fracture and their exact years. Or they keep on having a multiple fracture one after the other. For simple reason, the angulated spine cannot hold itself and it keeps passing load on the thing. And poor vertebra, which is the original fracture, just keeps getting more and more collapsed. So there's always increased wedging, collapse and neurological consequences. Worry is if you start pressing on the cord, obviously there is a problem coming in. And patient getting more and more osteoporotic do treat osteoporosis again the word is here is what i was saying the the, the fracture numbers are most at the l1 level yes d12 also d12 l1 are the ones which are getting most often affected and you better uh, take charge of the situation here because they have a dorsal lumbar angulation and they have more loading and uh, the, they tend to collapse more and uh, get more deteriorated and by the way at d12 there is a cord so the if it deteriorates furthermore the cord conus is there and sorry the cord is there and it kinds of getting compressed Remembering, for fragility fractures are a mechanical consequence of a biological disease. That word has to be remembered. It is a biological disease, osteoporosis, which has to be taken care. And again, reiteration of the same thing. Number of fractures will have more chances of having another fracture. Very clear study. The new vertebral body fractures, 
7, 15, 21 percent depending on whether it's a one previous lecture, two or three one, which I said a minute earlier. And that is why you have to treat. Now, we luckily we have some good medicines like teriparatide. It is a very, very good. It is a bone forming medicines. If you give it, you can give it for 24 months and it's a bone forming. It strengthens the bone and it can increase bone mass up to 15, 20 percent. Bone mass is increased and more so at the lumbar spine. That's the best part. Yes, it does happen in the hip and femur neck, but it is it, it is the maximum benefiting of the lumbar spine. That's the lucky point here. And we have to do it. But sometimes we can't give it whether it's a primary uh, hyperparathyroidism or there's a urolithiasis or these, these kind of patients or there is a chances of a malignancy for the matter. It was already, uh, you know, kind of uh, litigated for that point of view that it can cause malignancy in some patients. And that is where you cannot go for long and you cannot give it beyond 24 months. That's the limitation about the teriparatide. And this is what the two mechanics are. This is bone forming. We are talking about the teriparatide. But there's another molecule which has come in, which is making very good uh, help to the patients is the anti resorptive uh, drugs, which is there. And, uh, and, and denosumab is the one which is really helping with the anti rank L. And this is causing the, uh, the there's a resorption of bone. The osteoclasts are eating up the bone, so it stops the osteoclasts, and 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 the osteoblasts are activated by the what I said, so this teriparatide. So put together, you have a combo when you start with the teriparatide, and after once you're done with the teriparatide, you uh, give a either interval therapy with the denosumab, anti resorptive medicine. So you have a very good bone health, and that is how the plan is. You give teriparatide for 18 24 months then you can switch on to bisphosphonates for five years there is a problem with the osteonecrosis of the jaw that's a problem sometime or sometime it is about the gi side effects patient doesn't tolerate it so that's another thing or, or you can go with the denosumab which you have to give once in a six months 60 milligram subcute injection once in six months every six months you can go for 10 years safe very good safe and it can be used even in the renal disease patient like with teriparatide you can't use in the renal disease patients and that is can be really used and that is about the teriparatide. Teriparatide is about 20 mac every day subcute injection. So the compliance issue is there with teriparatide. And sometimes it doesn't suit some patients. So that way you, you, you get into catch. But otherwise it's a very good medication. Mostly it is well tolerated. In all case patients, you have to uh, manage with the oral calcium along with the vitamin D. That has to go side by side and that is a lifelong thing. You have to start now and carry on. Even in spite you stop all this. This is to be looked at. The, the plan has to be changed. The natural history of vertebral fracture is that if there is a fracture about 100 patients who are non-operable, one is operable, bad, you have to operate. It said two thirds of them will, reduce, will, 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 the pain will reduce in all these patients and within four weeks of injury. Good, plus, very good. But that's a normal healing. Other ones will have normal healing 63%. I'm happy. But there are 37% patients who have progressive collapse. Of these, there is a collapse healing in 23%. Remember, there's a collapse and then a healing. Now there is a change angulation now. Now you are already having a load on the other adjustment vertebras and they can cause a chain mechanics. I, I manage these patients differently, I'll tell you. Or there is a pseudoarthrosis in about 14% plus, patients. Not good to have this. And you don't know which one will have this. That's a problem. And there are some factors I'll discuss. And of these, 3% will have a neurological consequences, injury and sequelae. So please, you don't want this to happen in any case. And, and, and beyond that, look at the quality of life, look at the uh, quantity of life, everything has to be counted. And so that said, beware, delayed collapse in neurological deficit will be burst fractures in these patients, pseudoarthrosis or ligamentous injuries, instabilities. There you have to be more and more careful, all these patients. Yes, it's a downward spiral. Please understand, all these patients who are old, senile, like our own parents, grandparents, and they're going through all this phenomena with the increased mortality age related increased mortality again and again there are studies which said and not only mortality the morbidity and the life quality goes down and look at the times everybody's so busy except corona times lately everybody has been so busy all life and you don't have big time for the old people there and they're bedridden if you don't do something they're bedridden either you don't operate or you don't do cementing then you have to manage them conservatively there are issues i'll just explain although i would like patient to be treated conservatively as much as possible Look at this point, risk of mortality following clinical fracture. The maximum mortality risk is with the spine fracture. Then comes the hip fracture. That is something you have to be careful. There's a relative risk. And that is said, over a period of time, if you don't treat them, you have a more mortality. If you treat them, you have a lesser mortality. I'll explain. And if you put them on bed rest with the 
pain control obviously you have to manage braces this decreased activity they are on bed and given age older age if you put them on bed they have a inertia and, and when they bed ridden they have more of osteoporosis setting in and all this increases the vicious cycle puts on the vicious cycle yes painkiller very good but there are issues you have renal issues gastric issues the cns effects of the morphine other drugs and uh, this all is there and they are already a handful of medicines every day they're eating with the for other diseases and you want to add more medicine to that it's not a great thing to great idea or you put them in very good bracing tailor bracing and other all so sometimes they are not very happy uh, these people old people are not very happy with these braces young patient yes i can understand old people they are not good and they are not compliant also to this and especially in osteoporosis when it is not healing is bad and look at the beauty this is the old greek or roman times when they used to treat fractures look at this fracture they are doing a traction and they are doing lordosis and what intelligent thing they didn't know anatomy and they knew the treatment part and ideal very right very given on those times and same i use sometime when i position my patient for vertiplasty i'll explain that so i say fix the fracture don't fix the patient and if you leave them alone and they're in chronic pain then what you're seeing is it gets centralized pain so what is there it gets cemented in the brain and and i say cement the bone not the brain per se there are patients who have a habitual osteoporosis or habitual uh, fracture because of the pathological osteoporosis and this lady uh, keeps coming to me every 6 months or 1 year with a new fracture in spite of she is on fortio in spite of she is on denosumab so they have this pathological problem and you are trying to maximize but you still they keep coming with the fracture with the pain you not much of option than just to put cement so this is such a common thing and she is about 79 so this is happening you know and another thing is just x ray is not enough sometime what you do is patient comes you get an x ray x ray looks rosy good like this x ray is looking rosy leave them alone and you find it about a month time when patient was taken for another thing i'll show you another shot and it's totally collapsed and x ray will show a fracture here actual fracture is this painful is this if you look at this this was looking a fracture as per x ray but the painful one is this so don't leave it alone to the x ray if you have any doubt go ahead with the mris because you don't want to miss on fracture you don't want to delay the treatment part if patient is complaining of pain especially turning in the bed especially for of bending right and these are the images which we do this is actually t2 this is t1 and you have the uh, morphology show you show up here the pathology will show up in t1 and the star will show the age of the fracture so this is the uh, picture you should always get this done and look at this now these are the ones which are fresh ones this is the one which is old one sometimes you don't pick it on t1 t2 images and that is how it is the fresh and old ones and you have to treat the fresh ones obviously not the old ones you will leave them alone mostly if they are healed already and sclerosed already sometime you need a bone scan for simple reason there may be tuberculosis there may be pars fracture or there may be mats so this all is in india we have a uh, pot spine such a common thing such a common problem so we tend to have all this with us and uh, not to take any chances with them if patient comes out to be tubercular start with the att send them to chest physician mats primary work is oncological work up although you were going to cement them for pain reasons now the reason changes is more of palliative you now and if there's parts obviously you have to manage in a differently way so this is important and sometime you can pick these things even with the normal mris recent imaging the idea was you have this patient coming in a month's time and a patient came to me for cementing i tend to have fresh mri close to the day i procedure fresh mri or ct for the matter close to the procedure look at this this collapse now the treatment modality changes there is a retropulsion there is a posterior dehiscence obviously look at the posterior dehiscence that the modality changes and uh, and another point which i'm trying to bring up here is that patient got a lesion here also respect that again patient has got a problem to do with that also you have to manage that part sometime this patient came to me with the fracture you can think of cementing okay fine but look at this there is a large saw cementoma now this patient had a uh, polytrauma setting obviously your priority changes you going to look at this first what the patient anti anti platelet any other drugs and you have to look at this and this needs more care suppose there is any abdominal injury visceral injury you have to take care of that part first so that is to priorities have to change although for me cementing is a easy do you know and i tend to kind of at least fix the fractures and take the other things also along but you have to keep that always in mind when you doing all this i tend to get a 3d ct done for all these patients who are going to operate or do my procedures because that gives me a very good external look of the morphology fracture morphology although i have a ct also and i'll explain that 
I spend a lot of time in the scan room with all these patients who have to do cementing. And I plan my trajectories, I look at the pedicles, which pedicle I'm going to go, right or left, and what will be my direction of the pedicle. If you look at this thing direction, you might go straight in like this. But look at the dorsal pedicles. Dorsal pedicles are down sloping. Look at this, down sloping. And they are placed higher in the vertebra, in dorsal area. In lumbar area, they can be right somewhere in the uh, upper uh, half. But here, they are just at the top. So you have to angle like this. So this I will explain you. This is, uh, well, surgery surgeons, uh, they do good job. But look at this old morbid patient, comorbidities. And once there is uh, NSC unfit, PSE unfit, where they are going to operate. And when you operate, there are some issues with the post-operation with morbidities. And if it's nicely operated, then you have a transient syndrome coming in. And then the bigger problem comes in. The screws loosen up. Because the bone husband is not holding the screw, the screw purchase is very poor, so sometimes you put a cemented screw for the same reason. And this one patient has got a pseudoaneurysm because this screw is impinging on one of the vessels and it's called pseudoaneurysm. Very, very good depictive case. Or implant failure. This, this rod has gone broken actually. Somebody did a good job, but rod is broken in two sets. Again, the bone is collapsed back. Now you have to start with something else. Another such patient, three previous surgeries. Cementing, another cementing, Something went wrong, they did laminectomy and fixation. If you are very careful and if you watch very carefully, look at the cement, you know. It looks okay, but look at this. This is in the epidural space. Look at the posterior margin. The cement, this is posterior margin. Cement is epidural space. The patient was symptomatic. So we tried, we did a um, uh, spinal cord submission trial. It really didn't work in this patient. So patient was to be posted for another surgery. That is fourth major surgery. Redo of all. And sometimes, yes, uh, stimulators do help in some patients. Some, some set of patients, not all for that matter. Choose your patient rightly and wisely. Somebody did a cementing. Enthusiast, fine. But look at this, pedicles are all gone. This patient can't sit now even. Although somebody must have thought this may take the load. If you have not done a good feeling into your column reconstruction and this is not taking the load of the spine, obviously the load will, will be shared by the pedicles. Patient is not able to sit. And patient was morbid, so they couldn't go for a higher surgery. But I'm just trying to share, choose your patient wisely. Another important story, very close to my heart. A good friend and a very jovial friend and common friend to all doctors. And he had a nice looking diabetic and kind of a patient and to some extent osteoporotic. And he came to our, you know, he came with a little of pain. And my ortho friend, he said that he's got a small PIVD one level below, just give an epidural steroid. When I look at the MRI, see it by yourself and there was a clear cut fracture here. I told my friend, my friend, there's a fracture and this could be the reason for the pain. And he had a PIVD for sure. There's a, sometimes multiple lesions there. And that was a primary old uh, disc problem and there's an acute problem with this. This is the reason for the pain. So he said, I am committed and uh, let's give epidural. If it doesn't work, then I'll just, uh, you know, go ahead with the, instead I'll manage the osteoporosis part and treatment, treat this part aggressively and see what happens. Sometimes you are part of the problem, you know. So I blame myself for that. And look at this. Within two months time, exact dates are mentioned. Two months time, it became all flat. Can you look at this? Total waging? Must have been very osteoporotic. Alcoholic, keeps falling here and there. But a nice jovial person. He's only 64 man. And and uh, then it was a very big surgery done. Thoracolumbar area. By the way, this was a higher up place. You look at the D11. So they have to go for thoracolumbar brace area and they open the diaphragm and everything they did a very good vertebral uh, vertebra vertebrectomy titanium caging and screw lateral screw fixations nice good job they asked me to do cementing at these two levels which i had to i did cemented this i cemented this only then they could put screw there otherwise if they were not putting screws they were not able to put screws there this this patient was 15 days in hospital four units of blood hemo uh, hemothorax and the daring hemothorax he had a plus a desipluritis and he came out of that with the oxygen and some uh, you know, proteins and all. And uh, two weeks in hospital and I'm not going to tell the expense part. And uh, to be brought back dead one week after discharge. So this is something I feel uh, we have to avoid this. Where it is avoidable. It was very pure, clean, one simple cement in here would have been good enough. And patient would have been with us now. So I say we should respond to changing needs, patient needs and times. And it's a very nice quote, sir, which says irresponsibility is no single raindrop believes that it is to be blamed for the flood. So whatsoever is good and bad is happening in this society, we are responsible together. 
and intervention pain management catching up in a big way like intervention cardiology in all kind of these settings you know we we can really go to these patients and i say in this era of mas the percutaneous vertebroplasty should be in the first line of management in the vertebral body compression fracture especially in osteopathy setting should be in the first line and to to really have a clear cut uh, you know idea of what the whole talk is all about this pvp is an interventional technique in which surgical bone cement is injected under local anesthesia via a wide bore needle into fractured vertebral body via pedicle or otherwise and under imaging guidance providing increased bone strength stability instant pain relief decreased analgesic requirement increased mobility with improved quality of life and early return to work now this is coming to the procedures now this is the anteriorly when it's cervical you come from the anterior later like we do this procedure anterior this procedure when it's dorsal you would do a cost costal transfer because pedicles are very thin and they are straight or sometimes outward going so the, the effective pedicle is the costal transfer junction we go from here and that's the parapedicular you can call it in the lumbar we go transpedicular sometime parapedicular the transpedicular is the best just say cross section this is the uh, bone cadaver bone and we just look at this thing and this is what you are trying to say what plus is nothing you have to place your needle into vertebral body without breaching the medial border of the pedicle and filling the cement without cement leaking into the canal that's it that is all about body plasty remember there's a uh, basic vertebral vein here so when you trying to put cement there it tends to come out that's not epidural that's in the basic vertebral vein but uh, philosophy stays another point which i want to bring up here is you can angle as much you want to go contralateral with a single needle technique without breaching this if you breach this as you are trying to come out you the your cement might spill into the canal you don't don't want that to happen other important thing is you look at the pedicle angle of the pedicle is very very important in the dorsal area pedicles are highly placed and you have to angle below like this in lumbar area it's okay you can go straight like this and it all depends where is the fracture and what you intend you plan everything beforehand not during the procedure please understand everybody here is the pedicle we are talking and our needles is placed at the upper outer quadrant here right there it's about 10 o'clock at this level and other side is going to be at a 2 o'clock position you uh, upper outer quadrant because that gives you a leverage to go inside when you trying to go inside from here to here you don't have to breach the medial border pedicle for simple reason there is a nerve or neurosuction next to that so we going all the way from here to here that i'll explain you very very soon this is what we talking we have to take this pedicle without going medial to this because obviously the nerves and canal is there you have a drg nice looking drg your cement should not go in there no breaching of the medial border pedicle this is the anatomy and the intelligent thing is you start from the upper outer quadrant here yeah i i, I can hear some voice uh, can you just take charge of that anamul and this is here we have a step 1 when ap lateral i'll come to that again ap lateral we keep doing that and when we go step 2 and we go step 3 step 3 it becomes safe there after you you can just fly inside anywhere you want to go and that is how it is done the step 1 is upper outer quadrant starting point is there this starting point ap and literally you are doing ap i would rather say oblique not ap say i just squatty view or oblique oval view when you are at step 2 you always come and see the lateral view and you are the uh, somewhere in the middle of the pedicle when you are next to step 3 which is red line see green yellow red line and you are just entered the vertebral body once you enter vertebral body you are in a safe place and you can just go inside this is what the final position is like you are going from 1 to 2 to 3 this is arrow making never ever breach the medial border pedicle this is important if you done so please readjust your needle this is step 1 here starting i am giving you a radiological view and once you do a step 1 there is one point here i want to bring up because you are starting somewhere here there is a facet and nerve sometime this get entrapped you given a local first of you given a lot of locals you don't know patient may come with the pain there because of the facial nerve so you might have to block the facial nerve that you have to keep in mind step 2 this is midway we are just seeing the pedicle i am midway and we check in the lateral way you just gone half for the pedicle and in step 3 once you breaching the medial border pedicle in this ap view you already inside the vertebral body that's so is no worry that's the best part and that's the safe destination you just started and you are inside now your needle is already in the uh, interior one fourth you saw that's a desirable thing we tend to put everything into one perspective with this positioning needle placement which is very very important part of the procedure rather one of the most important part of the procedure is upper outer quadrant starting point lying like this and you are lying here in the uh, in the ap view 
and and when you are in midway you are just at the uh, pedicle you are midway and when you are just gone into the body you can be close to the middle border the pedicle here i to give you one tip when you are getting close to the middle border pedicle change your bevel towards the middle border of the pedicle so that it doesn't injure the middle border pedicle I, i'll i'll show the procedure so this is about multi viewing you in your mind this should play in your mind all 3d 4d should be playing in your mind when you are doing this procedure and vertiplasty is one of the very important procedure from that point of view although all pain procedures that way is right like this this is a typical biplane very desirable very costly not play, uh, possible every place but this is a desirable thing and it's a time saving radiation saving both and it's a safer also procedure wise this is you might go unipedicular or bipedicular i used to do bipedicular earlier but lately what i have realized is when trying to put a cement through this second needle first needle the cement is start extravasating from the first needle or the other needle second needle so they are all same cavity there's no point putting this needle there so what i start doing is start putting single needle and starting putting cement when i am not happy enough then i start take my second needle in and do my other work you know cement work mostly it is good enough if his osteopathic cavitation is there navigate the future people are already having navigation things coming up spine surgeon is very very happy with this screw placements and all same can be used for the vertiplasty this is a beautiful technique and its radiation safety is very good oam and radiation safety is very good this is what is said in thoracic costovertebral junction in is very very helpful because your pedicle may be straight sometimes it's outgoing and your needle will be outgoing so you cannot uh, manage the single needle either you put two needle or you go trans uh, you go uh, the costovertebral parapedicular like this this is called effective pedicle understand we have normally pedicle is this the effective pedicle is costovertebral junction and it increases your maneuverability and but i am against hammering i i i, I don't like to hammer a fracture vertebra it gives a lot of pain and it distracts the fragments so i use a drill put a k wire first because a very thin pedicle safety margins low k wire is easy you can maneuver it you can reinsert it but not the thick needles like this once you are in place and now this by the way d5 sir 1 2 3 4 5 this d5 and d6 this is a doctor patient is about 75 80 age and he had two level very bad pain and he wanted a cementing and this is what i did look at this so i'm right in there and here this is the first needle the second needle is going to be there over the guide wire i put my guide, needle over the guide wire so i secure one point which i want to mention is when i'm putting my needle over the guide wire always keep in mind the sharp edge of the guide wire should not migrate further in because there's a heart lung viscera and all there so what you do is you have a blunt tip needle so what you do is guide wire so you take this out take a blunt one and now you put a guide wire over this one i've learned this you know hard way one time it happened my needle went in but there was i was lucky god was on my side but it may not be the next time so please don't make mistakes this is what i was trying to say your major vessels are next to the vertebral body you have to be careful this was a very good fit patient was very very happy was absolutely pain free sometime you have to do multiple levels for one or the other reason this osteopathy setting you keep avoiding but when there's one bad fracture then you tend to help others also that's how it is you're trying to manage conservatively and when you do have multiple ones you don't do over on one side please this if i did this needle on the same side they will be fighting on each other so you do alternate like this step pattern so you can manage and maneuver this needle and cement inside that's how it is so you do this another thing which many people didn't do to more than three levels initially because of the uh, mero which gets pulmonary embolism so that was a very big problem with the respiratory issues now people are doing putting needles and aspirating the marrow first because if you are trying to put cement marrow will go in center circulation mero embolism will be there so that you have to be look for <laughs> this is about the venous drainage learn what you are doing know the anatomy know the whole philosophy if i have a needle here i am trying to put cement what is going to happen the cement might walk back like this that is basic vertebral vein but uh, if you just change the direction <coughs> the the idea i'll give you lead is if your cement is coming in a wrong place you suppose you got one of the vein one of the vein here or paravertebral vein just give it about 15 30 seconds your cement inside the body is at 37 degree it hardens faster and it then it's non flowy the one which you are injecting is a flowy cement will become non flowy so at that will plug the uh, vessel actually and then you can just change your direction of the needle and start injecting further but in the meantime when you are doing this maneuvering about wait of 30 seconds your needle should be clear of the cement your if your needle has a cement that will also get clogged and it's become very difficult to change the needle i have a technique i might tell you if i have time how to change the needle vertiplasty needle during the procedure some people do intrauterine venography yes or no we have to understand 
some people feel very happy they want put in a dye they see all this veins and all and they feel happy okay safe but look there is a black bone now now where to put cement so that was a technically a problem so there are two tips to this either you don't put a kind of a um, venography intoxic venography dye or you do is if you put a dye if it is gone somewhere like sometimes the balloons get burst typhon balloon get burst and his whole bone is black now you do is a lot of saline wash the the bone is again uh, to the tune of this and then you start injecting cement because you want to see each drop of cement you inject you don't want to miss on any drop which is going into the vein or somewhere into the spinal canal so don't miss on that that's very very important like in some patients who have been complacent this is complacency if your cement is flowing into the vein and is still injecting that means one is cement is too fluidy number one or number two is you are uh, you are too you know complacent about the things and you, you, your cm is not good or something is not good or that day is not good and it is gone into the into the heart in some patients they have removed from the heart it is gone to the lung there has been a death so please be careful on this it does happen please benign cement leaks all of the six walls of the uh, vertebra i'm not worried if it is going interiorly in the upper disc lower disc or sideways i'm really not much worried until unless it's going in the vein let it go around but it should not come into the spinal canal and that's where the malignant leak is all about it shouldn't come into the spinal canal if it's coming spinal canal it's not good please understand and it might need another big surgery there and then on the table you might have to do laminectomy you might have to do a cement removal depending on how much is gone in so we have to be very very cautious as soon as it start coming back be very vigilant of cement anywhere coming into the uh, epidural space because there could have been a posterior dissection so that you have to be careful there are some complications 1.4 percent will have a asymptomatic pulmonary embolism, not good, but it does happen. And 0.7 percent will have a nerve irritation because it might leak out, you know, paraneural area, and it can be managed with the local steroid later on if need be, or there and then if you already seen the cement coming into the root area or patients complaining. But rarely you need another surgery for that. The OT preparation, the most important thing is, except all of the things which you know of. The other important thing: keep the OT at low temperature, around 20 degree. Keep cement and the radiopaque powder and liquid monomer in two mixing bowls and saline in the refrigerator. Cool the cement before the surgery, before the procedure. Or you have a very good vertiplastic cement, you know that way. And this is the uh, position of the patient. Yeah, this is the position of the patient. I I like to keep patient in little extension and little traction here because I want to offload the anterior column. because i want to fail i want to elevate the anterior column so that's important thing and absolute sterility is important always keep spare needles don't depend on single needle please n number of needles i keep i have a set which got 20 needles ready with me all trocars because pushers and trocars because cement may get clogged in here and all those uh, you know all this uh, cotton gauzes and all for the pushing because you can't push sometime and the pliers rarely i use hammer now pliers and this is the stab knife for the skin and for the cement and this is dye and the loyalty this all should be there in the set ready and i use 2 ml syringes look at this i don't use uh, kits and i use syringes here i'll explain you another important thing i want to mention is a big bowl with a ice cold saline and this should be there and this is what i'm saying n number of needles right lying in here with the trocars i'm always keep everything spare a big set cook needle is good it's a diamond tip needle it's very sharp but very careful once you inside the bone you have to be more careful you don't want to go to interior this is important and then the injection devices and all this is there another thing is there are different kind of needles are there for the reason that you can screw in you can go easy smooth and the side holes for the injection and cement and all this is there and and uh, and this is the angle cannula which dr divan was talking the other day is very very useful you can do an angle cannula and do the Uh, targeted cement delivery at the area where there is a crevice is there some people like dr gore is using gore hook and which can be made to go lateral you know is a uh, articulated hook which can make lateral and you can elevate the end plates and then you can cement inside these all are innovations beautiful innovations yes there are cement delivery kits they are available with the companies but they are dirt costly i may say it's about 1000 us dollars approximately in india and in in usa and other places maybe 2000 maybe more so this is something a uh, little cost additive which can, which can, you can curtail you know so you have a, a good cement pma which works very very low cost and uh, it has got a high curing temperature which is good for denervation that's take care of part of the pain it is good radiopacity also 
So we have been using PMA very often, but lately they are very good cement is coming. I mean, it's calcium phosphates or composite cements, and cost is definitely high, but the curing temperature is low. That is it, and it's again ready, nice, ready to pick, and highly, highly compatible. There are some good cements now which is coming, which is osteoconductive, and they are bioabsorbable cements. So what is happening is when you're putting cement inside, it it, it one is it goes into trabeculation. It does you don't it doesn't move anyway. It is part of the bone now, not like PMA. Sometimes it is goes like a block. So it's not a happy thing sometime and it's also conductive. This keeps getting absorbed and the bone formation keeps happening. Ideal for young patients, ideal for young patients. And this is calcium phosphate in young patients, traumatic fractures or in prophylaxis by adding chemotherapy agent or reductive acetope in the cement in the tumor setting. This is another doable thing, which is new development coming in. Cement mechanics is vital. You, when you, when you start your cement, you know, I, I start a stopwatch here. When I start mixing cement and there's a dough time and once the dough time is there, there is a working time which is about 5 to 10 minutes depending on cement to cement. Some cements have 30 minutes to, uh, per working time. I'm not very happy on that but again I, because they tend to stay fluid. Whether they stay too liquid, too fluidy, their chances of leakage is higher. So I want cement which is neither too fluidy nor too viscous. They start getting harder by this time, stiffer and stiffer and it becomes very problematic to inject this stiffer cement. And the big problem is most of the accident happened at this point of time. When you're trying to pressurize cement against a needle with a full pressure and suddenly the, it, it, it gives it gives in and the cement has gone into the canal. So that's the worrisome. So cool the cement, cool this line. That's the whole point. And here when I'm mixing polymer and monomer, I do add antibiotics sometime. I do add a dye. This is my own innovation. Because to have a very good visualization, so what I do is, like in PMA, you don't have good visualization. Carter is very good visualization. What I'm doing is I'm adding the uh, dye instead of barium sulfate, my own Omnipec dye. And I've got a cement sample which is 15 years now with me and that's as hard as they were 15 years back. In, in, with me, it's a ex vitro, not in vivo, vitro. vitro. In vivo, obviously, they must be as hard, you know. And I did a presentation, body plasty, extended indication with procedural imp improvisation in one of the world congresses. I presented this uh, concept of mine, the uh, guide wire and Seldinger method as well as the uh, dye for opacification. And uh, well, what kind of anesthesia we have to use? We have decided for the procedure is going to be local, mostly we use or near left, obviously you will come thing. Generally is mostly for the surgeons, these are for the surgeons, we are doing a kyphoplasty under anesthesia. But then you have a neurological monitoring in place, otherwise don't do it because it can be nasty if it leaks. That's the point, you know. So that's how it is. The procedure part is sedate the patient, oxygen has to be there, your nasal oxygen, vital monitoring is there, prone position, adequate padding, bladder should be empty, patient should not be, uh, should be ready, you know, to manage the bladder part if uh, it, it takes a little longer, which normally not is the case. Vertiplast is a very fast procedure, half an hour max. And then uh, obviously fluoroscope view. You have to see all fluoroscope view, AP oblique, lateral, before you start, before you drape the patient, I would say rather. And total aseptic precautions of the all major surgeries and clean drape and do measurements. I do all measurements before and as I mentioned you. Localize the symptomatic material. People have done wrong level. Please friends, it should not happen. Count your fractures. Sometimes it's not so obvious. Count the levels, you know, the fracture one. And then you only put in. It'll confirm it in AP lateral oblique. Go up and down. Either go to the ribs or you go to the uh, sacrum and then relate. So what I say? Third last or four last from the sacrum. I don't say which number. Please understand, it's a third loss, fourth loss, or fifth loss. I go accordingly. A DNS is an obvious fracture. Choose your approach, either transpedicular or periperticular. NSI, skin subcutaneous, right up to the periosteum. That's where your facial nerve is taken care of, I was mentioning earlier. Skin stab, very small skin stab, and you can don't have to stitch, you can just put a bandit there. Insert K bar. Normally, I tend to put K bar. Anti NS is very osteoporotic, and my vertiplus needle goes in smoothly. And then I just put my vertiplast needle over the K bar. So put the procedure in a pictorial way. This is what I have my starting point, the putting the K bar, K bar, and over the K bar I put my needle into the body. And I just use bevel to the advantage. Again, remember, your bevel should be towards the medial side to medial pedicle, and that's where it's going to brush past the medial pedicle instead of injuring the medial pedicle. And once you're inside the body, you might have to go anterior one fourth or anterior margin, depending on what is your desired thing. And tier one fourth is good enough, and that's where you once your needle is in a position, only then you start making your cement, because your stop clock starts right then, and all this paraphernalia should be ready. 
multiple needles, multiple pushers and all those things and I put a dye. And this is vertebral cement injection. I used 2 ml syringes and, and cement is to be injected in the lateral view and it has to be live fluoro view only. Remember, please understand, live fluoro view only. No drop of cement is to be injected without a live fluoro. And that is how it starts. You start from interior, keep going posterior, keep adding cement in, stop somewhere in the posterior one third or one fourth. Please, it, it, it's so kind of tempting to put more cement in. But that's where most of the accidents are happening in even in good hands until unless you have a very good view of the CM. This is what it said. Done little position. Don't over inject. See, underfill is better than the overfill here. In dorsal level, maybe 2-3 cc, depending on fracture morphology and cavitation. Please understand, very important. This is not in specific generalization. The generalization. 5-7 to seven cc for lumbar vertebra. Again, cavitation and fracture. You And depending on if it's leaking or not. Use viscous cement. It's good to use little harder cement because it doesn't leak out. It stays therein. And especially in the kyphoplasty. And when cement hits posterior one third, stop it. And then there are other issues. Cement does go here and there. 67% of time, cement will go one, one, one way or the other wall. Whether it's up or below, anteriorly or sidewise, no problem. It shouldn't go posteriorly. That's the only point I'm trying to bring. Global fill is possible. Look at this. But it's not desirable. It's doable but not desirable. Please don't do this. I'm just trying to say please don't do this. Very important point here for my friends who are doing it. They would understand what I mean. When you remove the needle too early, your liquid cement will track back through the track you made. It's a cement nail now lying in the body, which is very, very painful and uh, patients keep complaining. Or you make it too late in the sense you, uh, you, 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 you waited too long and your cement inside the needle and cement inside the body, body they become one piece. And when you remove the needle, your cement, you see uh, there is a nail hanging outside the skin from here. So it has happened with me and it's only when you're complacent, only when you're not conscious of this and you've done a very good job. Take the needle out and suddenly you find there's a nail hanging outside the skin. Oh, now you removing this nail is a hell of a job. This cement inside the body, body. You have to break this and take this out. So what I do, and I always tell my assistant to be very cautious along with me. As soon as I'm out of the pedicle, I, I, what I do is I just break my cement. What is inside my needle and inside the body. So they are not in one piece now and take my needle out. That's what I do. The mechanism of pain relief. Why we do vertiplasty? How is it going to do the pain part? You know, relief is by virtue of cementing the fragments. Obviously, then there is a thermal neurolysis because of the heat which is coming, heat of polymerization which is coming, right? And then there is a washing away the nociceptor chemicals. Neurolytic action of the liquid monomer itself is to some extent neurolytic, mild neurolytic, and then allowing early emulation. When soon as the patient is cemented, patient start moving around, so pain of the bed rest is gone. You know, early mobility, immobilization pain is gone. And it is opposing the osteoclastic activity. So that's the way it tends kind of uh, help. There's few patient examples. I call it a quick fix phenomena. Patient fell in a Gurdwara early morning and he had a fracture. Yeah, and you look at the burst fracture and is diabetic and is about 65 or so. Same evening I put a needle inside. Just did a cementing underfill, not overfill I imagine. And upper border, this upper border fracture. And, and that's what it is. Next day patient is back and next week is back in Gurdwara. So this is the beauty of the procedure. I call it a quick fix phenomena. In right patient, again remember. Or you can these days with the terapeutic diet, denosumab, you can manage this. In a traumatic fracture in the polytrauma setting only. I would like to do a cement fill and that to underfill. Only, only kind of uh, sticky, make them sticky together and put them together. That's all. Don't overfill. Leave it to the nature rest of the job. If you have osteoconductive cement, it's much better, which I told you. And this is a younger patient. He had a polytrauma. Look at the head injury. And he had this L5 fracture. Neither patient nor surgeon wanted a surgery. He had a very bad head injury. And then he, we did a cementing and his was long, long back. 2000, by the way, 2005. And this is another polytrauma patient. We were doing a fracture uh, humerus car accident. And we found she has a back pain. Look at the uh, body. L1. This is a stable burst fracture L1. Stable why I said is because the column was intact. And height was kind of preserved. But it's an acute fracture. And that is, it is unlikely to look at this thing. I'll give you the history why I said so. And look at the fracture void. Very big void. There's a little, little, little position. That's a risk factor there. And this is what we cemented. We cemented and this is cement. And even glues the fragment which was there. Retropulsing fragment which is there. Look at this. Retropulsing fragment is glued in there. And the and this canal is safe now. So this is very important. Then you have to be very, very proficient. This was 2006, by the way. 
So you can take a calculated risk in subset of patients. <coughs> calculated means you have to be good. You cannot take chances, I said. Calculated risk, not chances. And this is that time. And this is a smile all over. She had a very bad, very, very, why it was important to do a very bad fracture of the humerus and head also. They put a three K wires in here and she had to sit for the gravity. And because of the fracture, she was not able to sit. She was a little obese and she was age about 60, osteoporotic setting. Her sister is osteoporotic, her brother is osteoporotic. There is a family osteoporosis. And that's why we had to uh, do this. And we, we could pull out uh, the very good result out of this. <coughs> this is her sister. To tell you the truth, she had one fracture, didn't go for cementing. Advised, she had second fracture, again didn't go for cementing. Look at the very risky, fragile fragment which is there. She is a walking bomb. If it goes back, transaction. And we keep seeing these patients. It's not it doesn't happen, it does happen. It's a nasty thing. And look at the unstable kind of thing, angulation coming up. And there is a osteoporosis must have been setting in. Look at this, tooth level I cemented for sure, which I had to. And third one, I just put in a trial cement and look at this, how much cement has gone and that is the next one to go. So we don't do it normally with the cement fracture sometime. And these are the patients you can pull out in time. Over conservatism can be dangerous. This patient was nice, 59 year diabetic patient, little alcoholic and he was put in conservative management. But there was a miss. Miss was that in two months, 18 days, patient was not checked for the uh, increased pain and all. I could see one x-ray in between. And there was a doubtful fracture at the another level. <coughs> so get an MRI done. Look at this. Real story, real life story. And there's an original fracture and there's other fractures which has come up. Six levels gone in that two months, 18 days. And he was left alone. Don't leave your patient alone. Keep a continuous workup. Keep checking for the other things and problems in patients, especially when patient is complaining. So it's, it's complacency again. And it's overconfidence. Okay, it'll be, it will be fine. You know. So what has happened is, Patient has got six level gone, so I had to do all six levels because they all must have been painful. In one go, I could manage. In one sitting, it took me three hours, and that was the world record that time. It was 2010 I did. Nobody did six levels. Frankly, they did one, two, or three for simple reasons uh, that it takes time, and the marrow will get aspirated, and you don't get so many fractures in Western world in one go, one time. They, they're not neglected like this, like it has happened in this patient. And this was a patient. He was he was not much. He was 59 only. Happy patient satisfied doctor. So sometimes vertiplasty outweighs the conservative management in such scenarios. Never be over jealous with the uh, vertiplasty or with the conservative management. You have to balance out. And I did a presentation in the World Congress in 12 in Miami. And I dear uh, Rex sir and everybody was around and he was very appreciative of the sixth level. Another patient, he I was given a call in the ICU. Patient was on ventilator. Call was is the patient ventilator, he's got a spine fracture. I said, why is on ventilator? Because he was put on morphine and he had a respiratory problem. So look at this. Now patient ventilator because he was given morphine for the pain. Now, one more important thing is in dorsal level, sometime there is a vertebral fractures and patient doesn't present with the vertebral fracture or pain. What happens is when there's a pain, there's acute bronchospasm, especially in respiratory patients who are asthmatic. So patient lands into the hospital with the acute bronchospasm, then the pain. And patients treated for the bronchospasm and the pain. Please understand these. I've seen these patients quite often. In the dorsal vertebral body fractures presenting as a respiratory uh, issue instead of the pain issue. Pain brings the spasm further, bronchospasm. So I, what I did is, I, this is a fluid by the way. Look for the, when there's a fluid, look for the tuberculosis and other things. And that all ruled out. Because in tuberculosis, there's dirt lot around. So that has to be differentiated. And the fluid, you aspirate the fluid, a straw color fluid comes out like a ganglion. And he put a cement back in, patient is walking next day. And this was a diabetic patient, he was diabetic rectomathy, almost blind. And uh, that, that was it, and he's uh, in the OPD after the procedure, in my OPD, one of the OPDs. So you give them their, their life back from the ventilator. There are some time vertebral body fractures, they're painful. This patient was 119 kg, by the way. So I did a cementing on this, made a bridge, patient is back to life, patient started doing exercise, routine activity, went back to 18, 84 kg or something. 89 kg or something. So the, they're back to life. Another such patient, the wife got the patient to me and the complaint was he's become addict with Tambaku and Pan Proc. And why, why is uh, addict? Because he's having a lot of pain, back pain. He was walking by the way. It's a teaser cord. Patient was able to walk, but ball bladder was gone. He was catheterizing himself and he was re manually removing his feces. And by the way, please understand my friends, the surgery has been done. Look at the laminectomy. Laminectomy has been done. 
but there was a miss this lamina this was not removed which is compressing the cord is getting teethered between the retrobursting fragment from the fracture vertebra and the lamina and cord was getting teethered so that's why and imagine there's when this black bone black bone means this is collapsing there is an active fracture going on merodema and this is one year after fracture by the way and one surgery was done one month after the fracture and merodema and ever uh, retropulsing fragment for same reason with all that due risk explained i did only anterior vertebral reconstruction only anterior vertebral reconstruction just to take the load off the posterior fragment which was there so it's it's not i don't educate others if you are not well versed with the vertiplasty technique it's very risky in sacral fractures it, it there are lines weak lines where the fractures tend to happen so you should realize that it does happen in insufficiency fractures or hemangiomas very very common or with the mats and you have to help the patient and this is what it is you go in the sacral ala put a needle in there cement them well and you're going contralaterally remember it's not you're going ala ala is a place you you can't do a cementing in the canal area that's important sometime if you have any doubt about the root being involved put the needle inside the floor room take the patient to ct room and now at the ct room you just put your rest of the cement in and i am putting my cement in coming contralaterally like this avoid the roots otherwise your roots get can involved it can be getting nasty here but if you don't do it again it's a very risky thing risky painful uh, thing there even cervical area can be cemented look the needle in there put the needle this is by the way two in needle white board two in needle and you put a liquidy cement which you tend to stay inside the vertebral is one of the hemangioma kind of scenarios and you put a cement in there in i had a patient he had a cba and post cba had a fall he was on all kind of drugs for a, you know 19 days in the hospital all kind of drugs he used to have a fall and he broke his uh, c2 here and that's why i did a transoral you know right run the anteriorly i put a needle in there put a little cement just to glue the fragment not much and put the patient on the otherwise conservative management and this is after few years he came down to me and it was all good i i i lost him lost the track of the patient i thought maybe he's there or not but he came down and it was nice to see him so your good work sometime you know shows up now this patient was sent to me with the vertebral body fractures to for cementing please understand by a doctor to me for cementing of the vertebral body there is a fracture here is it osteopathic fracture please look at this there is a lesion here there is a lesion here you get the scan done and if you get either the contrast mri or contrast ct or you do pet scan or bone scans and you find these lesions coming up it can be osteoporotic it can be pots and mats all these things they show up well do have to do a little more testing do have to do a right treatment on given set of patients if it is mats obviously they first go to the cancer center they come back to me i am the secondary physician for this patient then secondary doctor the primary becomes onco physician you better take a biopsy when as if you have any doubt in given subset of patients for for tuberculosis yes we do aspirate and biopsy even for the mats you do should take a biopsy sometimes biopsy is not done with the forceps there are some a uh, kind of a cutting uh, edge needles are there which can sheath this goes through this and it cuts a bone and then takes a bone fragment out and you take a biopsy and it's very very important to take biopsy or you may be litigated sometime please understand now this patient had a fracture and by the way he had a ca lung and he was a very painful thing so i did a intercostal block then parotid block then epidural block the last day i did a intrathecal block i'll show you like this and his pain went off absolute zero he said get my uh, ct scan i said why he said my cancer is cured so this is the beauty of the some good pain treatment intrathecal neurolysis i am very big fan of this especially in this torso pain but yes the pain stays and the problem there by the way the pain is taken care but the problem stays so i am doing a cementing this is c1 c2 c3 by l sorry d1 d2 d3 so i did a kind of a cementing in this patient this is 2008 right so uh, and 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 it's good it's always you have to reinforce but if, if there is a patient who has low expectancy don't do it or do a palliative if it's high expectancy like myeloma do a full work you know but carefully no leaks because in mats there are 5% chances of semen leak in otherwise osteopathic setting only 1% chance of semen leak in the spinal canal so you have to take that important thing this is which i've been doing for some time but i have seen a very good article lately that you can really ablate the tumor so you i what i used to do is put tool needle inside put two rf needle and do a bipolar of the rf or bicoplasty like we do in in the lower uh, disc here i used to do a bicoplasty kind of thing inside the tumor area so kind of burn the tumor put cement to some extent the tumor used to get 
kind of a shrunken over period of time. That was a good thing. And this was the article which I read. Very good. Treating metastatic spinal tumors with targeted RF ablations and along with that, RF ablation along with the radiotherapy, RT. So they combo combo RT only and RT and RFA. They found better result with the RT and RFA, 93% overall response. So that is something you have to do RT and RFA. RT alone is not enough. The few special cases about kyphoplasty, which sir was talking. Sir, am I, am I good? Hello, sir. Yes, you are very good. Sir, thank you. So I'm on to your yes. lab topic, which is what kyphoplasty. So I'm on to that, sir. So I'm just... Yes, yes. Yeah. I, it is a little lengthy, but it's quite comprehensive and inclusive, you know, that way. Of the intricacies and the side things, side lines, we don't talk normally. This is about uh, balloon vertiplasty or we call it kyphoplasty. So that's the philosophy. The philosophy is that you, you tend to gain high the interior column. The anterior column reconstruction is there, you gain height, the cement volume is increased, the, all those the kyphotic angle is re re decreased, so that way is better. But there is a very good study lately which says there is not much of change in quality of life, there is not much of change in the uh, pain scores between vertiplasty and kyphoplasty, they are, they are parallel. Other things are definitely better, but yes, kyphoplasty is a little costlier. But when you say you, you make the angle better, chances of loading the other vertebra is less. That's my plus point for the kyphoplasty. If you want, you can go ahead with the kyphoplasty. The difference is important, is under LA. Some people do it GA, I still do it under LA. Can be performed any time after fracture and it's less than four weeks after fracture because then the bone tends to get harder and the, fracture, uh, the balloon doesn't inflate. But high distribution only with the positioning which is told you. Extension and traction. I use it very, very often. I went to Hopkins and I saw people, uh, you know, missing on that. So I gave a word to them and then that was it. And that's the vertebral height distribution with balloon. Obviously, putting balloon, you don't have to do a extension part. Still, it aids to the balloon expansion and injection under high pressure. That's where the leaks are more often. That's where it is a problem. And injections are low pressure because you made a void and you have to fill the void. You don't have to. And you can use a viscous cement, thicker cement. That's the point. And then obviously, uh, the cost, cost part is there. This is what the whole thing is, uh, balloon and kit and all those things. You put a fine, fine needle first, over the fine needle put a guide wire and after the guide wire you put a thicker needle in there which is the uh, kyphon, uh, kyphoplasty needle there and, and through the kyphoplasty needle you put the trocar in there, make a space in the bone for the balloon and then you put the balloon inside. After you balloon open the uh, vertebra, vertebra or fracture, thereafter you put your uh, uh, the plungers with the cement. This takes about 1.5 ml cement, remember. So you keep putting every 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 0 0.5, 3 markers are there. So one plunger will take 1.5. So you fill 2, 3, 4 plungers depending on how much you want to inject and you start injecting. But once you're injecting cement, remember, cement should not fall. When you make it vertical towards sky, cement should not flow out of this plunger. It should come out as a vertical thing. That should be the, uh, you know, consistency of the cement when you're injecting inside the body. You want to make it a little harder than fluidy. And, and that's what the uh, balloon inflation device is there because balloon needs and this is can go up to 700 PSI, remember. So we can go 300, 200, 400 depending on the bone to bone or cavitation to cavitation. This is what I was saying. You go inside first and bring out the sheath needle and take a trocar now inside the uh, one, the driller inside and drill the bone, make a space of the balloon. So you have to drill uh, adequately that your, your balloon goes in smoothly. Make your balloon stay at the right place where you want it to be. Please understand. You shouldn't go on one side or the other. You shouldn't go two interior or two posterior. It's important. You have to keep balloon right place. And once you inflate the balloon, more it is inflated, more is ostrobid cavitation, then you know it's empty bone. You're meeting with empty bone. And this was by the vertiplasty. This was meant for the kyphon and inflation. Very important lead, when you're inflating the balloon, Please make your balloon stay at one place only because it tends to migrate in and out, right to left. So balloon inside the inside the bone, what I'm trying to say. So make it a point that it should not move inside because what happens is it takes a path of least resistance. So there's a problem. Like this ideal bone place, uh, balloon placement. You have AP view which is nicely well central inflated. In little view is anterior two third. See posterior one third we are avoiding because there may be a fragment which may get retropulse. So in tier two third only you are trying to do this and you just put cement thereafter. I mentioned you when you put a cement inside it should be consistency should be good enough. It should not just flow like this. It should just be injectable you know. But don't wait too long because if it hardens inside the needle you can't inject inside uh, this uh, sheath needle also. Plus needle. 
by the way this is my technique which i'm going to mention very soon i put a uh, epidural safety balloon from a segment or two or three segment below i'll show you that and that is how it is done one thing i just forgot to mention and i must mention now this so you make a cement in the cold saline why you when you make a cement in the cold saline your cement outside is about 15 20 degree ice cold saline rather and it doesn't get hard and faster it is a differential hardening with the differential temperature inside body is 37 degree it hardens very fast and outside it's about 50 20 degree it stays liquid for longer so you make use of the differential temperature to your advantage when you're injecting inside inside will get harder outside will same again the needle is 37 degree remember it might choke the needle so you have to be careful about that part this is very very important trick now this is you you make a void first and then fill the void simple that's life is easy Sometimes one balloon is not enough. You might have to do two balloons. Put two balloons. Cost adds there. But yes, if it is required, you cannot manage to single pedicle. Go two pedicle and uh, cement both sides. Now this is uh, there are some issues with the balloon. It doesn't inflate. You see, it's a collapsed bone. It is not inflating. The bone is already closed. It is not allowing. It's okay. You cement this much only. Bone is already hardened. Or the balloon is I said ectopic. I mentioned you earlier. Balloon may go place. It may go backwards, frontwards. You make one space. Next time when you try to inflate balloon other place, it keep going same place again and again. You don't want that place to go. So you have to hold the balloon in place when inflating. Very important. And if you over inflate, the bony spicule might, might be there inside, which might rupture one your balloon and your whole bone may go black. The dye may leak out. It's okay. Take the balloon out. Do a wash. You've done your job well. Do your wash now and start injecting cement. Do a slime wash before you inject cement. Again, I say. There are new systems which are there. The expendable systems. And this is the uh, jack which is there, which is doesn't depend upon the uh, eccentric ballooning. This this goes and inflates the area to your choice. So this is a very good technical device which is already there. Or there are some system VBS system where you have a stents. You inflate like stent, like in cardiac stenting. You inflate the stent, like a stent is there. You inflate the stent now, fill the stent with the balloons, with the cement by the way. Sorry, and it stays there. Same thing you do with the vessel plastic. You put a needle inside and you open up the vessel. What initially vessel plastic was bad because there was uh, it used to be a, like a ball, glass ball. It used to migrate here and there, and there have been cases of it migrating. They did a very interesting job. They did multi puncture in this balloon, multiple punctures. So when they are trying to put a cement through this balloon, it it comes out like a bacteriophages coming out or like a like a thorn seed, and it it kind of fixes itself with, uh, into the bone. And some cement leak outside also helps the trabeculation part. So that was a very intelligent thing going on. There are few patients where you have the uh, cord is getting compressed. Patient in mats is a widespread mats. Expectancy is low. You, nobody wants to fix these patients because obviously low expectancy and morbidity. Sometimes it's a morbid patient. Like this patient is very morbid. Un, uh, they are unfit for care surgeries for the matter. The, you keep getting these patients. Patient doesn't want surgery. Surgeon doesn't want surgery. Uh, but it is required. Some stability is required. In such scenarios, I have devised my own technique in which I show you. I put a balloon, sir, a space or two from below through a white bone needle. I put in a balloon. I take in empty space and there's a cementing going on here. I'll show you how I do it. This is the one where I'm trying to do cement in there. There's a fracture void. I put a balloon in empty space next to the posterior cortex and I just inflate the balloon for two reasons. One is it is stabilizes if there is any retroversing fragment or loose fragment for the matter. And as well as it might plug the leak if there was any to some extent. And third, very good advantage is it is visualization of your epidural space. I can visualize my epidural space, so posterior cortex for the matter. That's the best advantage of this balloon. And once you've done a cementing, you deflate the balloon. This is six centimeter balloon, six mm inflated, and you give it back to the cord. Cord is very happy and patient is very happy. At the end of the procedure, I do a myelogram. Check myelogram. I want to have a good night's sleep. I want to be everything to be clear on my table. At least I'm sure I have done, not done something wrong in these patients. Same thing I, I, I kind of device, same device which I'm seeing now. I, I'm able to help these kind of patients, dirty patients, very fragile patients and fragments which I could cement and they're back to life. Good number of patients are back to life. Otherwise, they would land for a bigger surgery which is either not doable or not desirable. Now this patient, she's 86, heavily comorbid and totally inoperable and in problem look at the uh, cord getting compressed in there and she is already getting symptom of the pressure on the cord and look at this in a very very daring attempt which i did is i did a kyphoplasty in this patient 
try to inflate as much I could. Interior inflation only in T column. Don't come posterior. Already there's compromise. In T column inflation with the balloon in place, I'm doing entry inflation and the cementing inside. And this was 86. Look at this 86 lady. And this, this is, and she was able to walk. That's the beauty. That's what you want out of the exhibition. Look at this. What do you plan, sir? Bone. This is distal. This, there's no bone. Zero bone. Air. You have air phenomena. And you, the bone formation is there. This is a vertebral reconstruction, I would rather call it. It's not a vertebral AC, vertebral reconstruction. There's no bone in here. And you construct the weight-bearing column there. So your load on the posterior uh, retropulse fragment goes out and patient is back to life. Old people, sometimes you, and they really need your help. They need a hand. So sometime if you're proficient enough, you can go ahead and do this good to the patient. I presented this in one of the World Congress in uh, 2016. In the uh, World Congress, I presented this epidural bone neuroplasty and foramen plasty and innovation that I presented that time, and it was very well applauded in 16. So there could be sometimes persistent pain after stabilization. What is it now? We should know in and out. I said in right in the beginning. Wait a couple of weeks. It may time for uh, delayed anesthesia. The facet syndrome or SI syndrome may be uh, coming up, or maybe it is there coincidentally, which was missed. The costovertebral tenderness is there because you might injure costovertebral joint when you're going through this ligament or joints. And sometimes rib heads are also fractured. Please know it. And even pedicles, people have done pedicle fractures. Please know it. I do pedicle screw. If I fracture pedicle, I put a pedicle screw in the sense, cement screw. And when I come out of the pedicle, I leave some cement there. If it is osteoporotic, if it's normal patient, I don't cement pedicle. And unrecognized pathology, do re-image, do another uh, shot, another CT MRI. And a new fracture may be there. Now this I was, I was trying to say, or maybe incidental pathology, you're looking at this, you're missing on this. So this may be patient's problem, patient may be symptomatic because of this, but this was emergency. You had to do this because this can give a pressure on the cord. You've done this, but missing this is not good. Or sometimes facet problem is there, you do a facet denervation and patient's taken care of. Recurrent pain after stabilization, very good. Reimagine, new fractures, it is said. The 12% patient will have new fractures in one year time. Obviously, 66% have adjacent level fractures and 33, 130 will have a distant level fractures. Please understand, third, distant level fractures, not contiguous fractures. And of this, 230 will have in one month time and 130 will be in one year time. Almost all of them will have in one year time. Because the disease is ongoing, treat the osteoporosis, not to miss no osteoporosis. You've done a good cementing, nice level there, another level come up. You will have to have. Sometimes you can manage the medication. You don't have to cement all fractures. You can just do with medical management like this one. You can do with medical management. There would be a situation you want to cement. It's okay because patient desires the cementing. In totality, last few slides, sir. Uh, the, the, the pain scores are really good ones. You know, after 52 months of follow-up, pain scores are better. Patient can manage without braces because brace is not good to keep. And uh, their uh, quality of life improves dramatically. There are a good number of patients, 84 patients and all, and they are improved quality of life. And yes, you get thumbs up from the patient. This is one of the patient, old patient, who had two level fractures, came from Nepal, had a cementing. This is post-procedure, sir, just outside the OT, patient standing. That's a beauty. So in conclusion, vertiplasty is in experienced hands and in appropriate patient selection. Very important to do a patient selection. It's a safe and very efficacious procedure for the treatment of pain and disability as we do the osteopathic compression fractures and and the procedure has already no complication rate low complication rate and with a very high success rate and but you have to be very proficient in your uh, this uh, ratio what we are talking now and vertiplasty is a palliative procedure it does not correct the underlying disease please look at whether it's infection or mats or osteoporosis all three need treatment in their own right you what you've done is stabilization and medical management of osteoporosis or malignancy must continue and it should be there. The best way to define your future is to design it. And I would say do it designer's way. Live by choice, not by chance. And we do uh, these workshops, you know, in India, sir, with your blessings and all, we're doing workshops. I did FIP and SIP both. And I'm trying to uh, take a kind of a charge and train as much I can. And, uh, you know, as many people go for FIP and SIP and they get trained further on. So it's always desirable. This is the, uh, one of the workshop uh, pictures, you know, not one, but I've done 16. The 17th was due and this got victim to the Corona, sir. It was 17th, 23rd April was due for the next workshop and uh, that is gone. We'll see as and when. It's a live on patients, by the way, sir. Live on patients. If any questions, I'll be more than happy to answer. I think I've taken a lot of time. 
so but i want to say you know pain relief is a human right this was said again and again in miami in montreal world congress and it is our duty it is our utmost duty to do this service to the humans and when we are doing this we are not doing only for our future generation please when i'm talking about the vertiplasty or kyphoplasty senile osteoporotic we are trying for our past generation for our parents grandparents it is in equal duty of us to help them as much we can and i am thankful to my family my beautiful wife gaini and my kids both are in toronto uh, no in canada now he's gone to vancouver is in uh, toronto and who could spare me to do all this work you know which i want to thanks my friends thank you everybody again thanks for your time thank you sir thank you for sparing time sir and uh, chairing this session sir i'm thankful sir it is uh, yeah it is such a beautiful you, wonderful thank lecture you, this is a beautiful wonderful lecture dr jain and thank, uh, thank you sir thank uh, you it means a lot a word from you means uh, a lot to me sir fortunate to attend lot of uh, you know world class meetings and uh, i've been fortunate to sometimes lecture and sometimes to listen to the lecture and this i must tell you you have presented a real world class lecture thank you uh, work is very good your uh, techniques very good um, you have uh, dealt with some of the most complicated cases uh, which is uh, quite commanding uh, you know i do for for as i told you earlier i do quite a bit um um kyphoplasty in my office it's this is one of the most rewarding procedure rewarding. that we have and uh, i love it um, but the, you must also appreciate the the practice of kyphoplasty or vertebral plasty across the world is changes is different based on the resources so uh, i do kyphoplasty in my office office based practice we don't have you know hospital set up because our our uh, reimbursement changes you know surgery center or hospital versus office so we set certain uh, risk we cannot take certain risk we do take but again this is what this is wonderful lecture we have some few questions so uh, i will give it to animal to uh, to uh, review the lecture the uh, the questions and thank you sir thank you thanks for uh, your kind words sir very... thanks for encouragement sir i am so so thankful to you and uh, as a matter of fact you said it is one of the most most rewarding procedure if i had a osteoporotic fracture which patient's lady is suffering and i think you have an eye balling is not going to heal by itself you have an eye balling you know it that is the time you don't leave it to the number game you do because for that patient is 100% correct or 100% wrong so we have a number game percentage game for the given patient is a 100% scenario so you really understand you give relief to the patient patient back to life like i told you a lady she had a 10 level 10 fractures at a different timeline so i did a cementing over a five different times if you don't do it she she has got a month six months or one year a good life and again she comes back with a new fracture and if you don't do it she is lying in bed so these are few things which is there very very likely said and we got to have more and more of these because of the increased age senility all geriatric people population coming so these are going to be more rampant problems they be, and it's a very good procedure but it has to be beautifully done it's like a cardiac angiography or stenting you have to be proficient you know otherwise you might do a lot of uh, wrong to the patient please that's important Yes, please. Any questions, my friend? Anamul, I'm here. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Actually, it was a very wonderful and comprehensive lecture. Uh, at a glance, uh, we <clears throat> enjoy every part of your uh, lecture. Uh, we have uh, some question in our chat box. Uh, can you um, open your uh, open this chat box? And I, I. Um, uh, yeah, you you can just put question to me, you know. So I'm I'm there to answer. Uh, ask me the question. Okay. Okay, okay. <laughs> If there is any any polyp trauma or multiple uh, fracture in the vertebral body, yeah. uh, should we better to uh, CT guide it or um, uh, or uh, anything else, just like uh, cautions by the chondrocilicer? No, it all depends. You know, when the polyp trauma setting, one you have to understand polyp trauma means what all trauma patients got in the body. You know, patient I told you, patient has got a humerus fracture, and and we found on table she has got a spine fracture also. or patient has got a spine fracture patient got a, a swas hematoma also so in a polytrauma setting like rta like these days we have a lot of uh, accidents going on world over you see what world scenario is so bad and so much of polytraumas are happening all around people are falling from places 
and they have a different injuries you know they may be a hemothorax may be refracture they may be a head injury i have to show you head injury patient also so a given subset of patients you have to prioritize what is more important to start with and what is next but the beauty of the vertiplasty and uh, procedure is that is such a beautiful procedure if you can make a patient prone for one hour without causing any harm in the pulmonary trauma setting of the patient or treatment of the patient at least you can take care of the fracture part because a fracture vertebra body patient is very very difficult to manage on the bed you have to turn the turn the patient bed you cannot make patient prop up and and then they are always painful and you are trying to manage that pain extra pain with the, all this heavy medications and sometimes i have seen and all this heavy medication of painkiller have got a their issue with the uh, with the renal status and other things so please understand do we have to calculate all the patient in their own perspective all these patients and accordingly manage but yes in good hands vertiplast is a very safe very good instant technique and if you can take get rid of this one problem without causing any collateral damage that is desirable for some reason if not then suppose patient has got a hemoperitoneum or hemothorax obviously that takes the priority patient has got a uh, intracranial injury that takes the priority but given scenarios as and when it is permissible to do a cementing i would do a cementing in a polytrauma setting or in a osteoporotic setting there may be a patient who is a polytrauma but bone health is normally good and we do feel that over a period of few months patient bone will heal i don't have to cement or i do a low cement i told you just gluing the the fragments so that it gets it gets sticky to each other and you don't do overfill because when you trying to overfill there is no cavity it tends to leak more than uh, just fill anything so these are few important things yes ct guided is again very important which somebody said i understand the logic now what is trying to say is when you trying to do in fluoro guidance sometimes we don't see the cement going in crevices and uh, you know kind of ectopizing but i gave a lead when you have the cement i put my as i but 20 ml of 20 gram of cement i mixing with a 5 10 ml of polymer liquid monomer i put about 5 6 ml of the dye omnipack dye 3 300 or 360 and i mix it with that this cement is beautifully seen with each drop and i am telling you it doesn't lose the physical property sir i've got a cement which i kept every year i've got 15 bottles for last 15 years for a subset of patient i preserve that cement because i bring the cement leftover cement home what i do is i do another beautiful thing i make a ball either a small ball or i make a small cube like a dice i give them a dice you know i said mark this dice play ludo at your home or i make a small ball and a ball is i said this is inside so you can relate with what is inside so how the bone is you cannot break that ball you know obviously such a hard thing so patient it patient is feels happy it gives them a confidence and and you have something to do you know is is said you can say a little of theatrics you can call it but it it is uh, right perspective you know another thing which uh, vertiplasty we should always do is when you injecting cement into the body same time you leave some uh, cement on to the patient drapes please or trolley for the matter now what is happening is what is happening inside the body will happen to the cement outside so you can say, look at the cement outside how it is behaving cement outside the body or in the trolley when it is getting hard inside is getting harder because it is 37 degree outside is about 20 degree so that is a kind of a cement sample which you keep outside and another cement which is there in the bowl ice cold bowl that stays liquid for longer so that cement i used to use to make a either glass ball or dice because that is still a kind of a semi solid kind of thing you can you can mold it it's like a mold you know you give that uh, to the kids to mold you know something like that so i make the dice out of this so that's how it is but but understand when you putting cement in the traumatic fractures you filling only the crevices to stabilize it another point i want to bring up here is if cement leaks outside the vertebral body i don't mind sometime i tell you why because i want vertebral body to be hugged from outside it's like hugging hugging somebody from outside nothing wrong small drop of cement going outside is not wrong but not too big too big ball outside is not great so please be very careful of that now practice here in uh, united states especially i'll tell you my practice i have not done vertebroplasty for last 7 8 years Sir. and that's basically you know the kyphoplasty is is little easier it's little safer even for somebody who has a posterior element fracture you can still do kyphoplasty because you are making the entire system um, a low pressure system versus vertebral plasty which is a high pressure system high. and the difference is you know as you understand when you inject the cement if it's a high pressure then by reversing your 
your injection is will take some time because pressure is already there versus low pressure system when you see the dye is migrating posteriorly or anteriorly you, you reduce the pressure and cement stops so there is there is a lot of control in the kyphoplasty system versus so vertebral plasty system and also others uh, we talked earlier is my injector is curved my injector is not straight so again for last seven eight ten years i have not done bipedicular approach i have always done in uni pedicular and that injector is so uh, steerable that you can actually go any area any corner if you have you know end plate fracture and if you want to go close to where the fracture is you can very precisely go there so that's another advantage of curved injector versus the straight injector so one lead here sir good very good very good lead sir one lead here if there's end plate fracture or any fracture which you're not happy with and you're trying to uh, inject cement and if you think cement is trying to leak out from that portion wait wait for 30 seconds that cement will block and clog that kind of a defect you know so sometimes some people do is they what they do is they put a little of cement and then the balloon open that cement stuff what is happening in that cement is spread to the wall and boundary so that makes a wall they makes a room you know so make a wall first room first then inject cement inside some people have done like same thing what sir is saying doing in kyphoplasty in kyphoplasty when you inflate the trabeculis these trabeculis go to the periphery they pl plug the holes if there are any crevices the day sense they plug the hole there now you're trying to low pressure system void is there thicker cement you're trying to put it is not flowing so it is going to stay there where you would want to be so that's the point but but there is one uh, hindsight to that if it is non osteoporotic traumatic fractures and balloon is not inflatable inside the bone so it tends to distract the bone that was one negative thing about the kyphoplasty in traumatic fractures in osteoporotic fractures beautiful in fractures where you can do anterior column reconstruction beautiful where the entry collapse but in a traumatic fracture one has to go very calculated that uh, you know when when i started doing initially when hammering the bone uh, the, it was again very painful patient used to jump you know so you start getting more careful and you start using drill for that reason over the drill i could put the drill in there put a little cement in there but yes if it is collapsed if it, even in traumatic setting in osteopathy setting nothing to beat kyphon rightly said nothing to beat kyphon that's a beautiful technique and uh, people and it's is is as doable as a body plastic for the matter in experience hands you don't feel big difference your needle is there you just have to put a wider bone needle through over the guide wire wider bone needle just change put a guide wire wider needle balloon open and you have a safety now that your cement is not going to leak is going to stay height distortion is there and uh, the pain is better taken care of so there was a very good study we, we said we also have a, we also have a different system sir and i don't use actually kyphone i use the system which is made by striker and in that system you also have a curator the curator is also steerable so i don't really oh. use the guide wire but i use a curator okay and the advantage of curator is if there is some scler sclerotic bone that prevents the uh, the inflation of the the balloon right sir and it's in a more ectopic than where you want to go you can use the curator and you can remove that part of the hard bone to make the cavity even better and even low pressure right good so there's so much of technical advances so much of scope philosophy layer and new things come up and then we just follow the uh, you know good work thereafter wonderful but sir. what you are doing is is really very commendable because you know the system i use is very very expensive it's a you know it's a, it's close to you know, depending on what kind of balloon i use it will cost me around four thousand dollars so you know it, it's expensive and it's a four thousand dollars not mine it's patients right so it's, it's it's very expensive so what you are doing is 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 really uh pretty good you know for the patients for the outcomes and i'm very impressed no by the way so vertiplasty the cost is almost if you just ask me truthfully what is the cost my needle which is jamshedi bone biopsy needle cost me about 2000 bucks only indian bucks i'm talking right now and the cement cost me another 2000 bucks or needle cost me 1000 bucks cement cost me 2000 bucks 3000 and rest is about floor and other things so my logistic cost of a procedure without balloon is about 3000 bucks 3000 indian rupees if i put a balloon there balloon people charge about a lakh rupee a double balloon will cost 130000 indian rupee so you can imagine right from 3000 it goes to 130000 with the balloons so that discrepancy is there although some people do a reuse of the balloon if it is reusable 
but they do get burst they do get this inflated and they are not you cannot put it back again in another bone so that problem is there but in totality this is a very very good uh, thing very very good thing uh, this is totally as i said it's a resource based practice yes. and yes, sir. we are slightly spoiled and you know <laughs> Uh, the, uh, the insurance, uh, the Medicare pays very well to kyphoplasty if, if I do in my office. Yeah. So we don't really think too much of, um, uh, you know, the money. Yeah. Uh, for example, what you are saying say, about cement is really unbelievable because I use cement with a cement mixer. Right, so sir. you can understand how spoiled I am that I don't have to do anything. <laughs> I take the cement out, I put it in the fluid and I put it in a mixer in and two minutes. Yeah. Exactly the, the the type of cement I use, you know, temperature of the water, what I use, use, and within, you know, 18, 20 minutes that I have after that mixing to finish my procedure. So it's really um, more kind of, you know, as, you know, resources that I'm provided with where I feel very comfortable and where you do is more creative, more, inter more in, in invention, yeah. feeling that, okay, how can I make my procedure which is uh, less expensive less to the expensive. patient. Uh, and, and it's really uh, very important to understand. Yeah. Um, you don't have to spend, you know, 150,000 rupees for, you know, balloon, which cost me 1500 to $2,000, which you are right, exactly the price that you say. Yeah. And you can also, there are some people even here who are in a periphery. They cannot afford, they use the, the steerable curator yeah. to create the cavity and not the balloon. Not the balloon. Which is pretty much the same concept is to create the cavity before you inject the cement. True, sir. There was a study which was saying the, the people with the uh, kyphoplasty and the vertiplasty, all the vertebral height gain and the, qual the quality of life is almost same over a period of time with the vertiplasty, kyphoplasty, but the chances of having reflex is more with the uh, vertiplasty than kyphoplasty. Number two is, the longevity of life they have done, survival they have done. Survival is better with the kyphoplasty than vertiplasty. Yeah. This yeah. Is yeah. Very, it's very good yeah. paper. So, uh, and I'm all, you know, if Dr. Jane and I, we will keep talking, it will take hours. So please go over with the questions. I don't want the listener to be disappointed because there are a lot of questions. Yeah, please. No, sir. Actually, um, I think uh, this is a very nice talk. Uh, because um, uh, uh, that scenario in our country also, that because uh, it, it's not covered the insurance. So, uh, people, a lot of people, they are suffering the osteoporotic fracture, but uh, due to the uh, cost uh, problem, we cannot uh, ditch uh, for every patient. And uh, and I think um, Dr. Nia Jain, sir, that uh, already told, that is a very nice because uh, it, uh, it we can reuse these things and cost may be minimized for the patient uh, sir we have another question that uh, when uh, after the osteoporotic fracture when we should uh, go for the vertebroplasty uh, we should wait for the some uh, times or we should go immediately after the diagnosis of the vertebroplasty very very good question and very pertinent question because this is there's a lot of change you know with this concept going on what is the right time some people said six months then it was 12 weeks then eight weeks so i asked somebody who has done thousands in the italy you know what is the right time you say normally you know we say about eight weeks or so but said if you uh, if patient comes from somebody else the protocol is wait eight weeks if it is not healed and a patient is still painful and you think there's a collapse going on so there's a collapsing bone painful and is not manageable with the pain management per se. Conservative management is the time for odiplasty, he said. But if patient is my own and patient is osteoporotic and BMD, again, why I tell you about the BMD? If the BMD is minus 3 or less, we do with the uh, oral drugs and bisphosphonates and all. If it is 3 to 3.5, we start with the uh, anti-absorptive medicines. If it is minus 3.5 and more, we start with terapeutide and other, other drugs, you know, for the treatment part. So all depends how much is osteoporosis, what is the bone health of the patient, what is the requirement of the patient, what level it is fractured, how bad is the fracture, what is the collapse uh, setting and you know uh, what is the backup of the patient. Suppose the patient is all alone, there is nobody to back up. These are the patients you try to help them with the cementing or vertebral augmentation for that matter. But then the time uh, uh, part you know that changes, it is not in specific. Like I tell you. I, the lady which had did 10 level fractures, if he comes to me with 11th fracture, I'm not going to wait for 8 weeks. Obviously, she's not going, to, not going to heal. I know it, you know it. Everybody knows it. So, is why would a patient fracture otherwise? 
So those patients, you don't wait long. You try to cement as soon as you see them. Otherwise, if a new case, new patient, always do workup. Again, remember, there's comorbidities like diabetes or alcoholism or patient who is steroid dependent. You don't expect them to heal by themselves. These are the patients you should help more proactively. But if it is one of the nice looking fracture in a non hospital setting, younger age, considering manage two, four weeks, six weeks, eight weeks. And if you think it's, it's not really helping the patient, it's a problem. Like my first patient, I give you an example. She was a teacher about 42 age only. And there was some chain snatching going on. Somebody threw her into the garden and she fractured her vertebra. <laughs> I put her on conservative management. Obviously not. My first patient talking to them four. So I said nothing doing it. My first patient again. But she was after my life that if I, if you don't fix me, I don't go back to job. I'm an ad hoc. I lose my job. My whole thing, life will be upside down. So what next you do is you put an adult inside, put some cement, patients back to the job, back to life. So there are a few scenarios which decides beyond the uh, medical point of view, the social aspect, the uh, emotional aspect, and the financial aspect of the patient. But yes, it, it all depends. If you are expert, then you have a more call, more options. If you're not expert enough, you better try to say conservative. That's how it is. Thank you, sir. We are, uh, we are also uh, doing... But uh, one more important thing, important word here, here. Anamul, okay, any patient who yes. have a vertebral body fracture and if there is a setting of osteoporosis, start with the anti um, um, osteoporosis medicine right away, osteoporosis medication right away, right then. Even if it's a younger patient, you have the different set of patients, different set of medicines. But if it is osteoporotic setting, obviously you have to start with the manage, medical management for sure. And that is continued even after the uh, fracture. It is a palliative procedure, they said. The disease is staying, so you manage the disease part. Okay, uh, I can see that Dr. Uh, Majhar uh, raised his hand for asking any questions. Dr. Majhar, can you um, hear me? Uh, please uh, unmute yeah. yourself. Hi, Sunny. How are you doing? Okay, okay Dr. Majhar. Hmm. Yeah. Okay, thank Hi. you, Dr. Milton, for this uh, webinar. Uh, this is very important webinar, I hope. And thank you, Dr. Professor Shudhi, sir, uh, as a chairperson, and uh, Dr. Niraj Jain, sir, a uh, very important person he is. And I got opportunity to meet uh, with Professor Jain. Uh, probably uh, it is a hands-on training, last uh, AMP conference in All India Institute of Medical Science Hospital. Pleasure. Pleasure. And I was highly motivated to see your work and your teaching, and to my mind, uh, you are one of the best pain practitioner, not in this subcontinent, I would say even in this world. Thank you. Because Thank you, uh, uh, you Thank are you a parallel love. expert, both in ultrasound guided and fluoroscopic guided procedure. And you are designated well trained by, by the master like Dr. Devan there, you know, so that way we are <laughs> See, this, yes, sir. I would, with due respect, just I would like to know, do you prefer to presence of neurosurgeon when you do uh, vertebral good, good plastic question procedure? Again, another good question. Uh, I have answered this in some conferences and I would give that answer first and I'll give you what is the right uh, way. When, uh, when people do a angioplasty and uh, stenting in the heart, uh, is cardiac surgeon in the uh, angiography suite? Cardiac surgeon there by the side of uh, intervention cardiologist, yes or no? That is the answer. Second thing is, when you want to fly a plane, be expert, only then be a pilot. Otherwise, be a passenger only. When you want to do a diplomacy, be expert, then you do this. Otherwise, stay as a passenger, stay, you know, like this. And I have answered both things in one go. That you need, you, yes, your neurosurgeon should be well informed. Then you have a diplomacy if something goes wrong and there is, there is a backup. That is important. But yes, it doesn't have to be inside the theater. That's very, very clear. Very, very clear. Because uh, as a big, sorry, as a beginner, uh, as a junior. For uh, beginner, well, yes, I said be a pilot. You don't fly a plane. You are as a co-pilot always, you know. Until you be expert, only then yeah. you are in the pilot chair. So in the beginner, obviously, when I say pilot, co-pilot, I mean neurosurgeon and you. That is what I'm trying to simply. Or people expert like Dr. Divan and me, your side. You do one, two, three, four cases, get expert, have the feel. And it, it, everybody's got a different level of skill and will. So the idea is... I, I say there is something called knowledge gap and something called skill gap. Knowledge gap you can fill with the lectures and all. There is something called skill gap which has to be filled by the live procedures and you know, side by side and hands on you know. So that skill gap has to be filled. Only then when you are at the same skill level 
you can be as proficient and as independent as any expert for that matter. So there, that, that comes with time. All experts, they have been uh, novi in the beginning. All experts on this globe, any subject, they were novi in the beginning. They took that help. Same stands here for the vertiplastic hyperplasty. Just because of the fear complex that your neurosurgeon has to be around, you will never, you know, kind of do. So you take a trainer like you drive, drive a car. There's a car trainer, but then you have to drive on your own. That's how the life goes on, you know. That's how it is. We, we have yes. a, a requirement here in, in the U.S. that if you are learning a new procedure, first thing you have to do is you have to have a training, you have to have a certification, and then you have to apply for these expanded privileges. What it means is that you have to tell the hospital or surgery center that this is what you want to do. When you do that, you are required based on, you know, the individual uh, requirement. You have to do at least five cases under a proctor. The proctor means either he scrubs with you or he stays there and watches you. Or somebody has to be there. But as Dr. Jain said, you know, the proctor is still not as responsible as you are responsible for your patient. Because the patient knows you. So unless you have that confidence that, no, I can handle it, uh, then you should uh, take this 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 step. And it's not just the recognizing the potential complications, but also preparing yourself that if do you do have a potential complication, are you prepared to handle them or you need somebody? If you need somebody, have you made that that arrangement? You know, and I think it's nice to work with surgeon who trusts you and you trust surgeon and who is willing to bail you out if you are in a situation. But you know, it's a, it's, it's a process. You cannot make decision just in a one way or one one week or one one in a day. It is as you go by, as you earn your more uh, reputation and more uh, more confidence, then you make the decision and go a little more complicated fractures or multiple level. But start with a simple. Start with uh, with something that you can handle it, and then you move up. Rightly said, sir. Start with the simple, start with the lumbar ones, lower lumbar ones, you got a wider thing, wider capacity, wider safety margin because the uh, the corda, you know, is forgiving some time because there's a lot of CSF there, so you don't leak them. And that's how it is. You start with the easy fractures first. Learn it well and then you start getting more into more difficult ones. Start with the easy ones to begin with. It's very, very important. And that gives you confidence, builds you confidence also. You should know the philosophy. And you can always do, take some models, you know, you have a cadaver bones, take cadaver bones, do some punches here and there. Open like I showed you, I open the word cadaver bones, open them, see if you're rightly, rightly placed, wrongly placed, gone too across, too much interior or, you know, on one side, two sides or too little. All the, do all this maneuvering first before you actually do on a patient. Then you do on cadavers, obviously. Uh, and then with some expert, like said, really said, be the proctor on and then you start learning and then start doing it. But obviously, first time when you're on your own, when it's like driving a car, when there's no helper in the side, obviously, you take an easy route first. Don't take a difficult route, you know. You don't yes, go sir, in a we hush are still start. We are still struggling that, to establish this pain medicine specialty in our country with the help of our senior. So in that time, if uh, if we make any mistake, if you uh, make any life-threatening, devastating complication, then uh, definitely it will give serious impact to protect ourselves. See, rule is, so, you, 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 you should do underfill first, number one. In when you're beginning your case is underfill. If you have any doubt, stop the case then and then instead of overdoing it. When you're trying to overdo, trying to complete the case, if you're not too sure, leave the leave leave the needle hole there do you don't inject semen needle will not cause any issue number one there's already fracture a punching needle will not be an issue putting semen at the wrong place is an issue so if you have any doubt and second as i told you a big big lead put a dye inside the semen the semen property is same same the physical property doesn't change much the dye starts looking beautiful on your siam have a good siam and have uh, you know a view that if any drop is going posteriorly See, drop going right level is no problem. Drop shouldn't go in the vein, it shouldn't go vascular. Like you're injecting semen, you're not seeing semen getting into the bone. That means semen is going somewhere else, like any dye in pain. If you're putting a dye, you're not seeing dye, that means it's vascular. Simple. Same thing happens here. You're putting dye, it should stay. Putting semen, it should stay inside the bone. You can see the same volume of semen is staying inside. It's okay. Number two, if it is really coming back, stop it. Doesn't matter. Leave the patient alone. The patient is not going to bother you for not complete, not doing a complication. You can leave patient alone and let the surgeon do the rest. 
or so x y z do the rest so not a problem but sometime it is said even a little cement does lot of good to these patients so overfilling is the one which is more complicating than the underfill underfill will never give you a problem it's only the overfill gives you a problem please understand overfill you can do when you two expert you know each drop i know and my assistant even knows where my drop is going if i am missing he is not missing please understand Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. So another point I would like to make is, you know, it's nice to know the surgeon's background. The reason why I said is, you know, the younger surgeons have um, more uh, exposure to minimally invasive procedures, but somebody who is trained or trained forty years ago mm -hmm. may not be as uh, good as in, in a percutaneous, percutaneous procedures. So just just to work with somebody that you connect very well. He trusts you, and you trust him, and then as a team, I think it will be always good for your patients. There have been few intelligent new surgeons which are proficient, sir, and there was a very good paper that there was some semen leak, and they could manage endoscopically itself. You know, instead of opening the patient, they could manage with endoscope. If you are proficient enough, like I do, a lot of endoscopy work. Suppose I day I find I my semen is just leaking, I won't take long. I'll just go inside do endoscopic work. I want a laser machine on me. So if you have a laser on you, and you have a drill on you, I have a drill, endoscopic drill. I have got lasers. I don't need to worry. I can just go inside and manage if there's any small posture because I pick fragments from the anterior space, all the disc fragments and all. I I do SCLD also, so that I you can go at endoscopically and have a laser along with this. You can manage. So idea is, but don't let the neurological damage happen. If it is a, if it is already a leak and there's a neurological sequelae, don't delay the uh, correction too long. There are mistakes. People have taken day or two or three for waiting for uh, recovery, and then it doesn't happen. Beyond eight hours, the cord doesn't come back. So it is very, very important. It has to be timely seen, timely known, and checked. Don't leave your patient alone. Always check on my table when I finish my procedure. I check for all neurological uh, uh, symptoms, uh, do sensory motor for the lower limb. Always, and even during procedure, if uh, my patient complains. If there is something going like unease down the uh, lower limbs or lower extremity, I I just get very cautious. I'm not overdoing it. Overdoing will give a problem. Underdoing will never cause it. You leave the fracture alone. That's all. Yeah. Let somebody else do the rest, but you're not done a harm. That's the point. Do no harm to the patient. Thank you, sir. <coughs> sir, I have a question. That uh, my when uh, we enter through the pedicle. There is any chance of pedicular fracture uh, during the thrashing of the uh, needle? Um, if there is any chance of pedicular fracture? So see, we are putting a about uh, you know thicker needle is about ten gauge needle. We uh, we use thirteen gauge. Needle. So what I guide by advice is I take my guide wire and I am going you know not going through the medial border pedicle. Remember that's I have been saying again. Then over the guide wire put my needle in. You have thirteen gauge, twelve, eleven, ten. Depends on what kind of fracture you have, what volume injection you want to inject, and what's your proficiency and which level of the body you know it's which lumbar, lower lumbar, upper lumbar. Or dorsal level, you know, higher you go, your needle has to be thinner. Lower you come, your needle can be thicker because there's more volume to be filled because volume is more, vertebral volume is more, and pedicle size getting bigger in the lower vertebral body. So that decides. Rarely you can cause fracture with your needle. If there was already a fracture there, then you can distract that fracture with the needle. That's a different thing. And that too, when you're trying to hammer needle through the uh, pedicle. As soon as you inside the uh, cortical bone, the outer pedicle, uh, at ten o'clock position, upper outer quadrant, when you're going inside, as soon as you're inside the bone, your cancellous bone is there. It's not a cortical bone; it's a cancellous bone, and you can really walk. Sometimes it's such an osteopathic bone. As soon as you you gone through the <coughs> cortex and you're just walking in through, through, you might cross the anterior border. So you have to be very very cautious. The needle actually falls sometimes. You leave it, and it falls inside the anterior to up to the anterior cortex. The point is, it all de uh, you know depends from patient to patient. Rarely you can cause fracture with your procedure until unless you're gone to left to right or you're really at the cortical borders of the uh, pedicle. That you have to avoid. If you avoid the cortical border, let it grow through the pedicle. It won't cause fracture by itself until unless there's a pre-existing fracture uh, because of primary injury, which you can distract. But if there is a pedicular fracture or distraction and you're trying to put cement, you put your needle inside the pedicle in the vertebral body till you're finished with the procedure. And in cement is getting harder now. Don't come out with the fluidy cement coming out because you take a needle uh, just outside the fracture area, your cement will leak out of the uh, crevice into the spinal canal. So that smartness has to be played. Then leave the needle inside 
beyond the fracture of radical fracture and let until unless i want to leave a cement kind of a track inside the uh, needle track in you know, a cement inside needle track just to kind of a uh, stabilize the pedicle fracture sometime we do it by intent very bad osteoporotic patient will never heal so what do we do is we are when you coming out we leave a cement track inside the pedicle does it art to that the art is you take the needle inside and took a trocar and just place a trocar at the upper outer pedicle area and now you take your needle out instead of moving trocar in when you take needle out the cement inside the needle stays inside the track area and it is not you are not injecting now you are retracting your needle over the trocar so this is beauty as soon as it's outside the area you i told you break the cement nail and uh, take the cement inside the needle outside don't leave it inside this is the point there's a procedure called you know it's dr jain explained very very well it's called pedicloplasty you know you just uh, either you intentionally proactively inject cement there or the technique dr uh, jain just talked about you put the trocar and you withdraw your uh, uh, needle and whatever cement is in the needle will be deposited into pedicle yes sir so you are actually but it's it's a very you know, i i don't recall i have done my my oldest patient was 96 year old so you know i have never seen even in a severely multiple fracture osteoporotic patient who was a dexa scan is around you know minus 35 even 3.5 even then i don't get the pedicle fracture because it's all about your skill if you don't manipulate too much if you don't go out of the cavernous bone and go into the cortical bone and you don't follow those guidelines you really cannot break the fracture and most of fracture are in the traumatic setting instead of osteoporotic setting remember osteoporotic setting right. the body collapses in traumatic settings even the pedicle uh, can go but then again your cementing philosophy changes there in totality there was one question uh, if i asked uh, dr milton one question dr jain for you was that uh, if you put this balloon in the epidural space are you not worried about the neuromotor deficit motor sense beautiful motor sir deficit? Be beautiful sir very rightly said where what i'm doing is i'm putting this balloon one is at about l1 and below number 1 so you have a safety thing it's a indicator balloon i call it and 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 there, there's a lot of space where you can the csf is compressible and that takes care but if i'm going in the dorsal cord like d11 d10 when the dorsal cord is thick so the, when i'm inflate the balloon i see to it that my cord is not getting compressed two three things is there you see the inflation volume and look at the patient patient is wide awake conscious there's no neurological damage as it is if you press the cord there is going to be unease at the legs if you press the roots there will be pain in the legs if you press the cord is like canal stenosis you are evident induced canal stenosis which is transient so that kind of thing another very good question and very lead important lead is i don't inflate these balloons more than few seconds at a time 5 10 seconds at a time the my my syringe is not inflatable i inflate and i don't do lead lock you know i sorry i don't do three way lock so i keep the three way open if i have to keep it inflated i lock the three way and let the pressure be inside like in lower lumbar region very safe i don't want my volume to loss the balloon volume to lose but if i have any doubt what i do is i don't put this uh, kind of a three way locking system i just put the syringe inflate and leave the syringe outside no more pressure if it doesn't take the pressure inside because of the uh, volume uh, fight so the the dye will come out automatically the the won't, balloon won't inflate much but the fact of the matter is if there is a loose fragment which is there sometime in posterior cortical dehiscence is a loose fragment they are not one which is causing the uh, real pressure is the cement and the pushing of the kyphon which causes further uh, injury to the cord that is averted so i do my procedure in slight extension number 1 of the body number 2 slight traction from below so in that way i am trying to take load of the anterior column that is one thing and second is when i'm trying to inflate this thing i do them alternatively like i inflate inflate this and check this inflate this check this so that way i'm taking a lead that if any way i my fragments is coming posteriorly i just stop my kyphon balloon that point of time i just look at it but putting both together it does help me that i'm trying to push the fragment back in its place i'm trying to inflate the anterior column so my posterior fragment is not going out it is staying in and uh, just anterior to anterior dispersed in the in line of the posterior vertebral cortex and then i'm just uh, once i'm done with this i deflate this balloon also so there is no continuous neural pressure like in trigeminal we have 1 minute balloon the trigeminal is gone 
same way we don't do this chord thing chord is little more uh, kind of a rigid that way so it doesn't go like this but still we don't keep it beyond 15 seconds at any given point of time at one time so you can do intermittent uh, you know uh, inflation of the epidural balloon but you always have a very good indicator 6 mm balloon inflated that means safe and as soon as my procedure is done, I take the 6 mm balloon out. The, the cord is happy. 6 mm is very good space in the lower, uh, the upper lumbar for that matter, you know. Is it, uh, is it, uh, uh, do you um, uh, control the pressure manually or you use the pressure manually? So we have both things. We have a manual pressure uh, and uh, with, along with the three wave, I think it's a safe balloon inflation. Patient is not symptomatic with my balloon inflation. I can keep the balloon inflated till I am doing the other procedure. But I still try to be on safer side, inflate and deflate because I don't have to keep the balloon inflated and keep the balloon inflated. Yes, if you have a pressurizing device, but we don't have to do because the manual pressure is good enough. And the balloon takes 27 atmosphere. This balloon doesn't get burst till 27 atmosphere. People use initially the Fogarty and other things that burst as 4 atmosphere pressure. And that's right. of no good. It doesn't hold the fragment for that matter. So this balloon holds the fragment in place. And, and the idea is, you have an indicator balloon, you are seeing what is happening in the posterior vertical borders, margins, and if there is any fragment, you are trying to push it back. Many fragments, by the way, so posterior fragment, cardio fragments, they are very loose. And they are waiting to come out only with the posture changes of the patient or jumping, running or posture change of the patient. But once you put them in place, you are putting cement inside, what is happening is, it's like you are putting a cement in the wall and putting half the brick onto the wall. Suppose there is a hole in the wall. You put cement first and put the brick on the wall and this brick is got caught with the cement. Same thing is happening is you are putting cement anteriorly, into your vertebral body and you are trying to push this fragment back in its place so it's getting glued with the cement which is there in the vertebral body. So it doesn't get, now there is no loose fragment now. These all fragments are stuck into the main body vertebral body. So you don't have loose fragments. Very good. That's the idea. Yeah, and all another question is? Yes sir, is there uh, any special technique uh, uh, of doing the vertebral hemangioma uh, where cement embolization is a possibility. What a question. Very intelligent question, sir. These people are asking very intelligent questions. I now know. All, I was going to say that there are you know, people 40 or something, they have not moved. They yeah. are all, I think, so much interested and yeah. you giving really good answers. So, yes, this is a very smart question. Ah, very, very good question. I think I'm impressed with the level of questions because that tells you your base knowledge is very strong. That's a beautiful part. See, hemangioma, depending on, like I said, uh, the Deramond and all those people started this, uh, the vertiplasia at C2 aggressive hemangioma. And that was, uh, they, there was no other option on this patient than to do this embolization and they started with this. So that was the start point. So it's a, it's a discovery. Necessity is the mother of invention. That's how it started. And thereafter, after getting good successful results, they're starting in other places, with initially with the hemangiomas. Now, coming back to then, was it was the osteopathic fractures. Coming back to hemangiomas, sometimes you meet with the aggressive hemangiomas. I've seen hemangiomas into the body, into the epidural space, into the peripheral space, and, and they're nasty hemangiomas. You have to see what is the runoff, how much is the arterial supply, you know, all those things you have to do. Some to be interventional, uh, you know, angiography people, they do angiography also. They find out how bad it is, the flow is there. But when you're doing a hemangioma, vertiplasty, the lead is use thicker cement. That's the lead, number one. Number two, when you're putting a lead, you, when you put a dye, a dye will go away. Obviously, hemangioma, the dye won't stay the same place. So you use a thick cement, start putting cement, so it doesn't flow. It's a non flowy cement. Use a thicker cement. And we start putting cement inside, it blocks, clogs the uh, whole vertebral hemangioma and you're making uh, the hemangioma in the vertebral body. This is a mass, by the way. Remember, vertebral body is a venous sinus. It's a bone and venous sinus. So you can meet with a lot of, uh, you know, venous hemangiomas in there. So when you kind of, it's a very common thing. And when you fill it with the uh, cement, it stays there because you use thicker cement. If you use thinner cement, the problem cement may flow through the, one of the offshoot vessel and get into the canal and other structures. So you have to be careful. Thicker cement, very logical. You make it more radio opaque because you don't want big strength now. It's not an osteopathic bone. Big strength and it stays inside. So you fill the hemangioma with the cement. That's what you intend. <laughs> uh, sir, we have another question. Uh, yes. Uh, what is the vertical Yes, I couldn't hear you. There was a gap. Once again, 
once again put your question again anamul look milta could you hear the question i think the question is yeah 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 very repeat the question when you have a vertebral collapse fracture yes, sir. there is a lot of stress on facet, facet joints and would you do a rfa I, i said in my talk you know when patient is it's an aging phenomena by the way it's a spine osteoarthritic spine and as it is you can have a facet arthropathy and this disease and all those things by the way incidentally they are there now there's a fracture now patient present with acute phenomena but remember when there's a fracture there's a change mechanics this change mechanics brings more problem onto the part of the collateral structures so there's a collateral damage because of the fracture there's a strain at the posterior ligament kyphotic angle is there there's more strain and obviously when you're doing a procedure you're going through the facet right where the proto quadrant you are next to the facetal nerve you might go and uh, hamper or bother the facet nerve patient may have facetal pain you do this but facet itself is a disease which was there earlier now patient got a fracture you submit a fracture don't leave the facet alone if i have a patient who has been having some problem and i has got acute problem i don't leave the other problem i treat that problem also so i do a facet rf in a subset of patient who has got a facet arthropathy along with the fracture which is likely there because of the osteoporosis and aging spine it's a disease of aging spine yeah way if you look at the look at the mri reading they see pivd annular tear facet arthropathy facet diffusion and what not you know and we know it and little recesses all those things are there so you have to treat them in their own right so that's the point you know it's not all vertiplasty is not to be facet uh, oriented and unless there is a facet involved but don't okay, shy away from doing facial work if there is a facial pain don't shy from facial work by the way very uh, good point there was a study done sir whereby they were trying to uh, you know kind of uh, do a study pvp versus placebo in the placebo part they were doing a facial injection they were putting needle in the face and doing a facial uh, you know la and they were trying to relate you know uh, pvp vis a vis placebo so that was their <laughs> facial so if you put a injection in the facial or put a a uh, kind of a uh, root block obviously pain is going to go that's that's how it is when when i was at the at while cornell uh, uh, chairman of the pain program i used to work with this surgeon i mentioned you joseph lane who is a, a very famous spine surgeon and we we had a protocol where he would do a kyphoplasty and after kyphoplasty he would send all his patients to me for a um, for a facet rfa <laughs> so it's actually you know it's a subset but it's a larger group of patient who are still continue complaining of back pain because don't forget you are only dealing with vertebrogenic pain yes sir you are not dealing with the facetogenic pain or you are not treating the discogenic, discogenic pain so you have to keep your clinical uh, mind still open that if your kyphoplasty is perfect why a patient still has pain what other you know foraminal stenosis and spinal stenosis and all those things should still stay in your mind all the time you do a differential diagnosis of continued pain after a perfect kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty true very true sir because patient knows one thing patient knows pain patient had a fracture that was we diagnosed your fracture was the main acute problem but what about the chronic issues which are there so they have to be dealt with and what sir rightly said a discogenic or facetogenic or any other component sometimes they have a leg pain post fracture there is a uh, there is a change mechanics you have foramen stenosis coming up in some patients they will have a leg pain or your cement may not be great and might have flown through one of those foramen areas we see some time and we just do a root block and all but one more important thing is when you have these things you don't put too much of steroids steroid vis a vis osteoporosis it is a fight whether in a osteoporotic setting with sinal osteoporotic fracture going on are you doing a bone forming and anti resorptive medicine again are you going steroid for some reason then doing a harm to the patient then good to the patient so that has to be taken care of so doing a facial rf is much more logical than putting a steroids inside body that has to be thought of however i will add one more thing that if your patient say for example patient did not have any radicular pain before you did the procedure and now after the you know kyphoplasty or vertebroplasty your patient has a you know radicular pain it doesn't mean you have created any kind of discogenic problem but your your fracture which is a posterior element fracture that may have pushed more on the nerve root because if you if you follow the spinal anatomy a nerve root is not too far 
from the posterior element of the of the vertebra. So that may have pushed it a little bit. And you know, I have done um, uh, transforaminol many times where the pain continues, it gets better, and you know, nothing to worry about that. But you, you really need to have your uh, set of differential diagnosis in your you know in your clinical judgment to deal with. Yeah, it's typically lateral canal stenosis where it is already narrowed and it's a narrow angle lateral canal, lateral recess, and suddenly a more small retropulsion and patients compromise. What sir is beautifully said, and but then uh, there has to be posterior cortical issue involved along with the fracture. That's important. I think Dr. Milton, I don't know how much time do we have. We, we are almost, uh, almost two hours. Two hours, sir. Yeah, we love it. You know, if <laughs> nobody's moving, so we have no problem. But uh, till uh, whatever time we have. No, but okay, okay. Really, Look, yeah, you know, with you around, is getting a half scale. Yes, you know, we have scale. Uh, program discussion. within five minutes. Okay, yeah. sir. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> sir, if there is any role of Ramai communicants block uh, during uh, the um, during this procedure. Yes, some people say it, that uh, if there's a lateral body fracture, this is uh, can be sympathetic mediated. Although they're mostly nociceptive fibers, some people are trying to do the sinovertebral nerve. Some people are trying to do that. Do with that that part, you know, for fracture reasons also. But if it remains is there, it's an anterior fracture. This is can be uh, like anterior disc is sympathetic mediated. You know, we know it. So same way, this can be kind of a thing. So some people tend to do remai communicant block. Or one thing is, is there, some people do a sympathetic block for reason because it increases the vascularity of the area. So that sometimes is the reason. Or rarely there is a chronic fracture, there can be a sympathetic mediated component or sympathetic maintained component we call it. So that can be one of the reasons some people tend to do a sympathetic block along with that. But that's not the primary intent. Uh, what you do is like if you're putting a cement inside and if it's already heating, it's already taking care of the peripheral nerves by the side of the cement. That is taken care. But if you want to go, you can do a RMI. Careful when you do RMI. One aspect, very important aspect. When you do RMI, your spinal artery is coming next to the RMI. Always remember. Last time also I said, when you do ischogenic pain, some people do RMI communicators. But RMI and spinal artery, which is coming to the aorta diac, branch aorta, are very close by. So you have to be careful when doing RMI. That's something when you went careful. Never ever burn the uh, somatic root, which is going like uh, lumbar roots. And uh, you can go anteriorly and do a sympathetic block. That is one aspect. But remai, yes. If you are proficient, go and do it. But if required. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, actually, sir, uh, I request to Dr. Uh, Professor uh, Shri Dion, sir. They uh, say uh, something regarding to the uh, our country, especially in Bangladesh, because uh, in our country, uh, uh, vertebroplasty and typoplasty is uh, did very minimum. I think uh, we, we can count this uh, the number of the patients. Uh, so, what is your um, advice to the newer generation uh, 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 um, uh, doctors? They are coming uh, from the uh, pain uh, for last two or three uh, years. And uh, what your advice, uh, please, I, I request to you to advise uh, for these uh, young, young doctors. So, um, um, Anamora, this is a really very good question and I would um, really like to address it. One is that, you know, the generation of yours, you guys are all very fortunate that you have so many ways to learn from so many experienced uh, physicians and and when we were in training, we had no where to go other than they find out Dr. Bonica's book or somebody, and there were no courses, there were no digital uh, videos or anything like this. Mm -hmm. So the best way to address that issue that you just mentioned is education. Unless you educate yourself, unless you educate your colleagues, your referral physicians, unless you educate your spine uh, colleagues, this will not happen. Because you know it, it is uh, it is not necessary to believe <laughs> that we are so poorly resourced that we cannot help our patient. That's not necessary because you heard from Dr. J that there is so many things he does. It doesn't really cost you a lot of money. You just have to educate yourself and you have to uh, you know equip yourself with a very good skills and training, and you can do it. 
but uh, the most important is the education and not i meant not just you know knowledge based i'm talking about the skill based and that's very important and again uh, because you are surrounded by good experts you know i mean i'm so uh, honored to know dr jain who knows so much and you guys are next door so somebody like him you know he can really guide you to lead you to proctor you i think being careful is very important you have to get good training educate yourself educate others and and just keep in mind you are there to help your patients and sky is the limit but with that you also have to learn you know i used to tell my my fellows at cornell that it is very important to have a knowledge it's very important that you train and you do learn to do every procedure but it's also equally important where not to do the procedure where to when when to stop doing the procedure and those are the the comes from the education you do not really learn from the books you have to see dr jain actually making the decision or you have to see me struggling and and stopping the procedure then that will educate you okay this is what my job is not just to learn how to do it but also learn when to stop and when when not to hurt your patient but otherwise you know i think one of the thing that i have learned through wi wip and being an examiner in fipp and dealing with uh, you know so many wonderful physicians across the world that resources should not stop you doing what you want to do now i used to believe that oh we are so uh, you know privileged and we are so resourceful and we can do that india cannot do or bangladesh cannot do or brazil cannot do and we are wrong i have traveled many countries you know 22 25 countries to give lectures and to learn from them and everybody does wonderful job it's just different way they do it so i think you know uh, you all have a lot of opportunities to learn to uh, be more more uh, uh, motivated more uh, aggressive and uh, i think you can do it yes sir beautifully said okay. yes sir when not to do and when to stop is more important and that is only learned people understand the people who know i knew they will keep doing those mistakes you know so it's always good to train them when not to do when to stop is very very important and what you said is uh, there you should have a will uh, dr anamul which you rightly said people want to do it that's the first is the will then you learn the skill and then you can will you know so that that comes in line you know so but then very rightly you have to you have to learn in right yes way and then do it and sir i keep saying one life to live we have to learn we have to teach we have to benefit patients we have to do all good one life to live like you have maximized sir i'm so 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 great that i know you and uh, you know grateful to people that uh, around you know who have been such a good teacher around but there are so many good opportunities people want to learn when rightly sir said you have got an opportunity you have everybody next door you can go to workshop when we started or sir started for the matter i i used to go for one day i used to go from new jersey to uh, another town you know one day one day exposure or uh, shadowing one day shadowing so and from here to usa i'm saying no, india to usa and india to another town just one day so we had a very tough time learning all this gathering all these skills and everything but then it was a very very strong will and that is how we could come that far and and you are lucky that you have everything at exposure at your place and if you have a right will you we catch up fast what we are learning in 8 years you can learn in 8 months that's the point i'm trying to break because of the exposure because of the volume now there was no volume initially for the pain pre patients now there's a lot of volume the other yes sir the other thing you know i would like to uh, emphasize or is i don't know whether you know but i'm a formerly a surgeon i i did my surgery in india and i had my private practice as a general surgeon and i did a lot of you know including one year of neurosurgery and so i did have a very um, successful surgical career and when i came to united states most of the thing that we were doing there with a very minimum uh, resources and here there would be a extra resources without any outcome into uh, you know patient's uh, you know, outcome so my my point is this never feel that you know we are coming from the you know third world countries we have limited resources we cannot do certain things no that's not true the brains that we have in third world countries is not 
as good as in in, in a developed countries, and I mean it. Not I'm not saying that to criticize developed countries, but in developed countries there is a lot of technologies that that spoils you. It takes away your your clinical judgment. That takes away your ability to put the hand on patients, you know, so, you know abdomen or spine, and and make your clinical judgment. All those skills are blunted when you are so uh, spoiled by the technology. So I have last 10 years when I started uh, traveling a lot, I learned myself that I, I'm not going in any country to teach them. I'm also going there to learn. And that actually has made me a better physician, better skill. And, uh, you know, that's what I would message give to everybody in, 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 you know, in India, Bangladesh, Pakistan, Nepal, whoever is listening to us, that the the lack of resources should not be a, a reason not to do what you want to do. So best master is always the best student first. <laughs> and always, and always, all life, sir. Yeah, yeah. Knowledge is such vast, it cannot finish. All life, sir. Salutes. Yeah. Salutes. Any question, Dr. Anamol? Thank you, sir, for your... Uh, uh, Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Professor Divan, for your uh, nice um, uh, uh, for your nice uh, way. How to learn and how to spread this uh, pain uh, in uh, third world country as well as uh, uh, developed country. Where there's a will, there's uh, a so way, Anamul. Uh, there's a will, there's a way. Very, very, very uh, comprehensive and inter inter informative because uh, it is a very important uh, topic. Uh, mm, those patients are dealing with the uh, pain, regarding the pain. And um, a lot of patients actually we uh, visit uh, that uh, uh, osteoporotic fracture and uh, sometimes um, um, hemangioma and something other like uh, the vertebral body problem. Uh, so I think uh, it is a very great discussion and uh, really we are grateful. Uh, uh, Professor Dion uh, on, and also the uh, Nia Giants are because uh, they share their experience because they are they are very very uh, experienced person and um, they are they did uh, this case a lot of and experience their I think we might be losing because yeah. we are actually uh, running out of time. Yeah. I think we can say, yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah. okay sir. Okay, sir. Now uh, we are uh, we are uh, thanks to all and uh, really grateful to our uh, chairperson and uh, uh, our today's speaker. And sir, we can we can conclude our program. Thank yes, you. I think you know before before Zoom kicks us out. <laughs> <laughs> let's 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 stop it. Yeah. For another day, another time, you know, it's a pleasure, sir. Pleasure okay. sharing you. I thank pleasure you, sharing I with thank you. you, Dr. Milton, for to invite me. It's yeah. always educational. And Dr. Jain, you are you are amazing. So uh, thank continue. You. Thank you. Uh, the educators have a very special respect in my heart. So you and uh, Namol have a very special place. And uh, we will continue our collaboration like this. <laughs> stay healthy, stay safe. And uh, have a good night. It's Thank actually you, noon here, so I'm gonna go and grab my lunch. Thank you, sir. Bye, Thank sir. You. Bye, Thank bye, you, sir. Thank, Thank you so you, much. Sir, for enlightening our night. God bless all. Thank you. Sir. God bless all. Okay. okay, sir. Bye. Bye, sir. Bye. Thank Pleasure. you, dear sir. Okay. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye, Dr. Anamal. Bye. Bye, my dear. Take care. God bless good you. Good night. Good night. Thank you, everybody.